The Perfect Parlay Pursuit is for entertainment purposes only. To support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash perfectparlaypursuit for our full picks and predictions. Enjoy the show. No black cats, just straight facts. Triple P certified. Listen, we can talk about odds all day. It doesn't matter what the odds are. It matters what's going to happen. Welcome to the Perfect Parlay Pursuit. We are here for a very special break week episode. Not only are we going to break down Cyril Gan versus Tai Tuibasa UFC Paris two weeks from now, but we have a very special guest joining the show to recap last week's epic main event, Leon Edwards versus Kamaru Usman, and help us break down the main card of next week's episode. Uh, guys, we've got Joe Selecki coming back. Alex, how you feeling? I'm feeling great. <clears throat> As the only winner on the show, uh, oh yeah, and Dan's not here because he is overseas. <clears throat> he is overseas currently. He's in Spain, right? Madrid? Dan is in Madrid. We are here, the two of us, but as a special treat, we got Joe Selecki and... We're going to give you the full UFC Paris early predictions. We're going to go through the whole card top to bottom. We're not saving the prelims to the Patreon this week. You will have to get our official Triple B certified predictions with Dan next Monday on the Patreon. But if you want a glimpse into how we're thinking early, then you can get the full card top to bottom UFC Paris. I've studied more than I've studied in the last two months. I'll tell you that much for this card. Just had not much better else to do on Sunday. Alex has reportedly told me he is unstudied. So you'll get both sides. You'll get the hip fire thoughts and you'll get the kind of well-studied thoughts on mine i'll be able to carry the show but like i said joe selecki's gonna come on the show he's gonna talk about all in grappling his grappling event that he had that we sponsored and give us his thoughts on what was an epic uh ufc pay-per-view event i mean in my estimation a lot of people were saying it was a little sleepy i think the co-main and main event made up for it alex it's like that's what you pay the 70 dollars for that's what you pay the admission fee for for moments like that fights like that you know um Let's get into it. Leon Edwards, Triple oh, yeah. P certified Leon Edwards. Dan, Alex, and I all locked up on Leon Edwards. We Triple P certified the underdog against who some were calling the greatest of all time, the greatest welterweight of all time, Kamaru Usman. And we won our pick, guys. I even called out plus 500 Leon by KO. I mean, that seems like a paltry sum plus 500 when you think about Leon being plus 15,000 in that fifth round uh, moments before he got that knockout. The commissary team couldn't have predicted it. We couldn't have predicted it. We did predict it. But at the end of the day, I don't think anybody was thinking Liam was going to pull that off with one minute left. It was one of the most epic comebacks. Um, you know, I was saying that that card was like something out of a movie during the Rockhold fight. I was like, this fight is like a movie fight. It's like one of those fights where both guys are just landing clean and not and just taking immense damage. And, you know, it's like a Tekken fight or something, it, it seemed like. Um, but then that main event, I mean, that moment. I've talked too much, Alex. Give us your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I came out a winner this weekend. I, I saved myself. I did a last-ditch effort, put some money on Leon Edwards. Was trying to take Leon Edwards by knockout, but there was so much line movement uh, toward the end of the Rockhold fight that DK shut down the whole shabam. They were like, nobody's betting on this fight. I couldn't get any action until both fighters had already walked out. And by that time it's counted as like a live fight kind of. So they didn't let me bet on the outcome. They only let me bet on Leon Edwards. But that being said, still walked away with a little chunk of change up, I think 33% on the night. I put out 300, came back with uh, four. So not a bad night for your boy, especially the way things were going. Um, you know, you have a huge favor in Romanoff really spoiling the party for us uh, with a night of very suspect refing and suspect judging as well. I I was happy to make it out alive, but I was even happier to come out on top. I mean, in that last minute, John Attic says uh, something that was just so perfect for the moment. Basically, Cormier, Rogan, they're kind of talking about how Leon is broken. His corner is trying to get through to him, but he's just kind of phoning it in. And they're saying how he's just seems like he's resolved to losing a decision, a moral victory for him. And then Annex says, but Leon is not cut from that type of cloth. And then as soon as he says that, head kick, knockout. I mean, that moment to Leon sitting atop the 
the ring as they played the Rocky theme and the crowd chants Rocky to the advice his corner gave him before coming out. If you were really locked in and paying attention and watching that fight go go through, you were witnessing a drama akin to any theatrical play you've ever seen, any movie, any blockbuster film. I mean, it was poetry in motion. And I was saying to my girlfriend watching the fight with me, I'm like, you don't get this in any other sport. It made me so proud to be a fan and a planted in fan, somebody who's been here for so long and really understands it all. I mean, there's just so much, there's so much karma in the UFC. There's so much like the universe kind of correcting things. Like, you know, I, I Leon, who's been just down and out from the start, forget his UFC career. I'm talking since he was 15 years old, you know, single mother, father murdered, history of violence and drugs and gang life in his past. And all of a sudden he comes out of that and already has a success story by being in the UFC. But then for him to become a champion, right. And do it in a way where he corrects what happened to him in his last fight with Nate Diaz, almost finishing him with one minute left and kind of claiming the moral victory there and leaving him kind of with uh, not really any of that Diaz push that you get from fighting Nick Diaz, Nate Diaz. And it's like him for him to do that in the last minute. It, it's it's like Weidman and Silva, right? Or Weidman breaking his leg and then in turn getting his leg broken later in his career. It's like all these things kind of just sync up in these moments that just, uh, I mean, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, it's insane. In fact, like as to your point, where no one saw that coming, I went, I came out in the Discord and I retired from gambling uh, moments before. Leon Edwards went out there and head kicked him in the fifth round. So probably like 30 seconds before I put into the discord, I'm retired. I can't do this anymore. Herb Dean has money on this fight. He has to, there's no way it gets officiated like this if he doesn't have money on this. Um, but amazing, amazing stuff. I instantly said psych after the knockout, believe me, I, I'm, I'm not done. You can't keep, you, you can take the fight out of the dog. You can't take the dog out of the fight. Yeah. Well, you did mention something, you know, putting out 300, winning 400 back. And that's the kind of icy roads I've been skating on lately where, you know, when we started this podcast, it was a $10 bet each week on what would have been the perfect parlay if it hits, right? And then as we've had our successes, the gambling bug comes for all of us. Gambling's extremely addicting. We're doing essentially a supersized me-esque journey into the mind of madness by gambling every week on UFC um, for the last two and a half years. So, through this journey, I mean, I've won thousands and paid for vacations and ended up, you know, feeling really good about myself on some weekends. But then those wins, they inflate how much you bet the next weekend. And I end up giving it back, so to speak. I mean, if you're watching the show, you know, we went on a tear for like five weekends in a row, of at least coming out with a tiny bit of profit or coming out with some serious profit. And then I lost three in a row. And in this weekend, I was like, let's try to win back some of those losses, bet a little bit more. And ultimately, it was Alexander Romanoff who spoiled that effort um he was the only one on that parlay that would have essentially cleaned up all my mess from the past month if that if he had won everybody else on that parlay hit that night and we would have ended up with um a boatload of money cleaning up some past losses really it would have been a lot of winnings because i was cleaning up the last couple weekends where i went down a few hundred bucks but it would have been in the thousands and i told myself win or lose i'm coming into next week after the break week with a different mindset i'm getting back to the roots of the show the perfect parlay pursuit. I'm pursuing the perfect parlay with a $10 bet. And then I'm not going to bet much more than that. As far as like hundreds of dollars every single week, I'm going to limit myself as an act of discipline to a hundred dollars a month, 25 bucks a week. And I'm going to see where that gets me over the course of three months. I'm going to play that out for two or three months. See how that, see how that goes. I'm going to play more if I win more on these small bets, but I'm going to build back my bankroll with house money. I'm going to regain some fiscal responsibility. If we're playing every single week, I can't be betting 300, 400, 500 dollars every single week. It gets a little out of hand. When you're winning, it's fine, but you end up giving back some of these profits. And I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to gamble for the long term, lunch money to rent money style payouts. And that's what you'd expect from me moving forward. But I think I got a pretty good strategy. Basically, I'm going to do my perfect parlay with about a $10 bet. Then I'll probably do like a half a half of that parlay with the $10 bet. And then I'm going to do five bucks on like the best underdog that I think could win that week. And then I'll compound that each week back to the million dollar dog challenge. Um, Because we know we're we're always just a few right decisions away from becoming millionaires. I mean, you take a dollar and you double it on on twenty underdogs, you have turned that dollar into a million dollars. So I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start uh, at level three, bet five bucks, try to double it each week, and see where we can get with that. But I'm gonna approach things a little bit differently. Um, But I got a real good look at next uh, card coming up, UFC Paris. I took a peek early. 
Um, Alex, I mean, to me, the, the one that stands out from last week's card that I want to touch on before Joe gets here is just the Alexander Romanoff fight. I mean, to me, it's like he dominates in the first round and gasses out. And it's not the first time he's done that. He's an undefeated fighter, but he's kind of given us, given us glimpses of this in the past. And I didn't consider Ty Burr that big of a step up in competition. Um, I, if he's having that much trouble getting through Ty Burr, it's the point where he loses the fight. And, you know, much like David Onama, it had a lot of stink of David Onama on it where, you know, he's running around afterwards. He's jumping on top of the cage. He's celebrating. And it's like, bro, where was this when you were fighting him in rounds two and rounds three that you lost, you know? Um, wish we could have got the draw there and wish Woodson would have been a no contest and we would have been well in the money. Uh, but alas, did not occur that way. Woodson got the draw. Man, thank goodness Luis Saldana need him in the head. But what do you think about, you know, those two kind of weird weird outcomes on those two triple B certified picks? Yeah, I certainly thought it was a draw going into the decision. I mean, I don't know how you do not score the first round as a 10-8. It doesn't make any sense to me. Any judge who didn't score it as a 10-8, he literally pitched a shutout. He struck him 27 times, didn't get touched once, took him down three times, and had probably four and a half minutes of control time. So what more do you have to do to get a 10-8 in the UFC besides rocking somebody? Like, yeah, obviously, he didn't land a single strike. It was he did not land a single strike. He gave no offense. And, you know, the great Greg Hare said it in the Discord – eight points would have been too much. You know, eight points would have been eight points too many. So I I don't understand how that was a majority decision. I, I definitely thought we were safe with a draw there. Um, I was a little bit more shaky about the Sean Woodson fight, even with the point taken away. So I, I don't know, man. I don't know what these judges are looking at. I don't know what these refs are looking at. This week made me very frustrated, um, especially with the infractions in the main event. Um, Kamaru Usman's putting his hands in the gloves the entire time. Uh, Leon Edwards is on his back. Leon Edwards is the first one that gets a fingers in the glove warning. Kamaru Usman grabs the fence five separate times in the second round, three separate times in the first round. And Leon Edwards grabs the fence one time, gets a warning and sat back down. So I, I don't know what these judges, what these refs are looking at, but right now, I, what I knew what I knew about this sport has went from here to here. Cause I, I don't even know what they're looking at anymore, Luke. And you could tell they haven't been back to Salt Lake city in a while because the elevation was a huge factor. Every single one of these fights, people guessed. Exactly. Well, uh, Alex and I are now gridlock tied at 67% accuracy in year three, 111 correct picks out of 166 given Dan is 64% accurate and she'll be certified picks are 78% accurate 63 out of 81 after that event. But very interestingly, we dug into another statistic, double P certified picks. So these are picks where two of us agree and one of us is on an island by themselves. If two of us agree, be it me or Alex, Alex or Dan, I didn't dig that far into the combinations. But if two of us agree on a pick, that pick is actually 64% likely to happen. So Dan and the double P certified picks are the bottom of our accuracy percentage with 64. Triple P certified picks lead the way at 78. And me and Alex are deadlocked tied at 67% for first place. So just wanted to get that out of the way, uh, moving into next week's breakdown, update the stats and everything like that. But I thought that was really interesting about the double P certified picks. And really, Roy's looking for an edge in gambling. If we can get over 50% accurate and we can get underdog odds, I mean, I would say that's a pick that I would be looking into very significantly moving forward. But with that said, um, I'm going to welcome our guests to the show. Joe, we're just talking about last week's card, UFC 278. Kind of a boring card. Nothing really stands out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually fell asleep during the main card. It was uh, very uneventful. Dude, that was insane. That whole night was insane. Uh, gosh, dude, the Rockhold, uh, Rockhold and Costa reenacted Dada Five Thousand and Kimbo Slice. Yeah. <laughs> they had an excuse because of the elevation. And do you think the elevation really was what played a role in that, or do you think it was just the damage Rockhold took in round one? I mean, Costa came out within the first thirty seconds, bludgeoned him. Um, yeah, dude. Here's the thing. I have another theory on this. I think it was altitude. I think it was probably. Coming out so hot and getting rocked out of the gate, your legs go. There's another aspect of this that nobody has talked about. Not to, you know, go too far into it, but it seems like this, there's a couple guys that have before fights gone in and talked about like how much they've been using psychedelics and how much it's gonna help their career. Uh Kyle Kingsbury, if you remember this is a long time ago, I forget who he fought. It was three 10-8 rounds. Like he just got manhandled. Donald Cerrone, after talking about how he saw the whatever shape it was telling him what he feared most and now I'm good to go out and fight freely went like this and it could have been five time 
Um, I can't think of the other one. And then Luke Rockhold. You're like, dude, like, but then again, he also fought valiantly, but he looked like trash. So uh, I don't know if there's anything to that. I'm of the mindset, and this is probably like, you know, this is probably the same as boxers, you know, staying away from women for 12 weeks. But I don't think a fighter should mess with their mind like that ever, you know. I think if you're going to do that, that should be something you should do after your career or something. And I think that was like a totally different guy that was like, it looked like he was having like a existential crisis during the fight. You know, like he's cursing at him and throwing overhands like he's fighting his demons or something. It was, it was bizarre, you know. So I do think that probably played into it in some way, shape or form just in the mental space, which can tire you out. I don't know if that's right or not. That's just like bro science. And Joe, I, I was, I mentioned it last week on the show. I said, if somebody's main point of why I should pick you to win a fight is that I just started using drugs, I would say you're a madman. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing is it's a form uh, of escape. You know, I know some guys like, like they'll, they'll use certain things to go home and unwind. And uh, while I don't do that, I guess I can understand that because you're relaxing your body or something. But this is like a whole like mental escape where you're like, Mm -hmm. I think it's good to go through the whole camp having to face what could happen to you. And, you know, think about Paulo Costa, not like you can't go home and check out, you know, but you're doing that at least through effort. Like you're like, I'm going home and I'm not going to think about my opponent right now. I'm going to watch a movie, you know. But when you're like, I can't get this off my mind. I need to go escape and get away from it. I think there's something to that. And then eventually you're in a, you're forced to face it. And I think maybe for the first time, it was when he's in front of 22,000 people at high elevation after three years out of the cage. And you're like, oh my gosh, my legs are gone. My arms don't work. I'm hands on my knees tired because, uh, you know, Costa has not had the best gas tank and has a ton of muscle. And while he was tired, he didn't look like Rockhold. You know, Rockhold looked like he could not do it anymore. But maybe there's something on the other side saying that's why he was able to get through it and, and push so hard. But it was just really strange, you know? If there's a case for a therapeutic use of these substances, then you have to remember the two biggest things that they would do in a setting of therapy, which is the setting of that, you know, uh, ritual, the setting of the ceremony or whatever. If you're preparing for a fight, you're now taking your brain and you're, you're undergoing this kind of like reset mode where now your brain is a lot more malleable. It's more open-minded. It's, it's, you know, you've unlocked these different pathways, but that's a double-edged sword. It's like, yeah, for somebody who's really looking to, you know, rebuild from past trauma, whatever, um, like you said, at the end of your career, you know, you do these things to kind of like understand like the perspective of your life, whatever. But when you're doing it along the way, you're opening your mind up and you're in this very vulnerable uh, state where you're, you know, the, anybody would tell you this and you studied this with that, you're more, um, more, more suggestible. You're, you're kind of just like in a state of vulnerability, I would say. And now you got cameras and you've got spotlights and you got a weight cut and you got all these different stressors you could see that luke was very stressed and it's kind of counterintuitive to the whole hippie hip, hippie vibe of like oh i'm gonna do mushrooms i'm gonna smoke pot and i'm gonna be all like free-spirited but you got to remember that like you're still the mind is not a boomerang you can throw it very 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 far it doesn't mean it'll always come back to you and sometimes you throw it out very far and it takes time it's like a wave you know luke threw his mind out into this this deep sea and now the waves are slowly bringing it back but hey you got to fight now so <laughs> there's no time to to kind of process all this. And yeah, I agree with you. I think that a lot of that stress was, was um, exercised during the fight. And uh, that to me though, was what made it a valiant performance was you saw Luke Rockhold want out of that at the end of that first round. I mean, the body language, even Henry hoofed felt bad for him. He was talking to Perlo. He's like, he's exhausted, man. We can't. <laughs> Perlo's like, of course he's exhausted. It's a fight. Come on guys. Like get, get, get right with it here. Perlo had to be the, uh, the bad guy in the room. He, Henry Hoof was, was just good cop that night, I guess for Rockhold. But uh, but yeah, like he, he had opportunities to check out. He had opportunities to whisper his corner, throw in the towel, dude. And they wouldn't have been unjustified in doing so. Everybody would have forgiven them. Uh, but he didn't, you know what I mean? He was in there. And that last moment of just, if you don't know what Rockhold was doing when he rubbed his blood on his face there, like you're not a competitor. Like you, everybody's been there in your life where you've just been like so frustrated, but you're like, you know what? If this is all I can do, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> You don't know how many wrestling matches I got DQ'd from just throwing headbutts because I was already losing so bad. I'm That's like, really what I'm talking about. hey, rubbing blood is within the. <laughs> so I'm not really talking about that. I'm more just saying, you know, it's a wrestling match and like you're digging your chin into the guy's back in referee's position because you know he's up ahead on points, but you're like, he's not going to enjoy this <laughs> that I'm here where the ref lets me be here. So. I've I've up kicked a few chests in like gi jiu jitsu matches, like it was pride, like kicked him in the chest, like it was a. Uh... 
you know, Japan 2004, like just frustration, like losing by advantage and like, oh, yes, <laughs> I, I, I totally understand what he was doing there. And speaking of moral victories, there's no bigger moral victory than what Nate Diaz had when he fought Leon Edwards. And we were just talking before you got here about the kind of like karmic balance that exists within the sport of MMA, where like if you are paying attention week to week as we do, where we are butts in seat for every single fight because we are gambling on it and we're just trying to be a part of the living history of the sport. It's like if you're really paying attention, there are things that happen that are stranger than fiction that really like that you, you couldn't explain to somebody who doesn't know. It's like. For in that moment that Leon landed that head kick with one minute left in the fight, it was like he corrected the previous moment of Nate chipping him up in the last minute of the round, which really stole the the story of the fight. I mean, nobody was talking about, oh, Leon Edwards looked great after that. They were all talking about if Nate had one more minute, he would have finished that fight. And uh, Leon, in one moment, made life fair again, as Teddy Atlas would say. And what do you think about that main event? Dude, you, you just literally right in that last sentence stole what I was going to talk about which is Teddy Atlas, because that's what I was thinking about is like so many nights, I feel like him where like, he loves the integrity of the sport and you could tell he always respects like the good guy for the most part. And like, I feel like that. And like, you know, four out of five events, I leave like, Oh man, like one of the guys I like lost or this happened. I hate it. And then every now and then it writes the ship like that, where you're like, man, like this sport is like poetic and this is why I've been watching it for so long and why I always will. Like, and that was it. And the other thing I thought was cool that kind of right the ship or the wrongs or whatever you want to call it was, uh, that same, when he called time on that body shot was the same thing that Usman did with Covington, that it was mm-hmm. a clean shot. And had he not done that, maybe the entire sequence is off. Maybe Edwards is a little more tired. His brain's not working. He doesn't throw that fake left. So, you know, who knows? But you're like, it, finally you left with somebody that was cheating, getting penalized. I mean, he was grabbing the cage all night long. Uh, Edwards got called for it the one time he did, but Usman's known for like putting the cage between his gable grip and locking hands. And all kinds of things. And you're like, man, like, I, do, I don't like seeing the guy that's unbeatable. You know, it's probably because I don't, I don't register with that guy. It doesn't, like, I'm like, I'm never going to be the guy that's like, he's not beatable at all. So I, I was just, that was just, that was amazing, you know. Um, and I don't think it was luck. Like, we saw how skilled he was in the first frame. Like, when they were both fresh, he dominated. Which I don't want to, I'm not a big Colby Covington fan at all, actually. But when he says, like, CEO of EPO, it really does make you wonder, and uh, oh, I hate when people make accusations or anything. He's like, uh, you know, ejected his ass. His- but the thing is, is like, look at the muscle he carries. He's notorious for having bad knees. He can't run sprints, can't run. He only does aerodyne, which is sufficient for conditioning. But but he keeps, it's not like the other champions. The other champions, they get fatigued, but they they don't gas ever. You know, they keep a good output. He keeps the same explosiveness in round one through round five. He's got more muscle than anybody we've ever seen. And somehow when he comes out of the corner, he's always fresh. The only person we've seen like that is Dillashaw. So it really does make you wonder. But uh, I think skill for skill, Leon Edwards is just as good. I don't know that in a rematch, I wouldn't I wouldn't take him. I think, I, I think the same thing can happen in any single round of a rematch. So I think that's pretty awesome. It was an exciting fight. And they got Dana White thinking about having an outside event at Wembley Stadium, which would be absolutely amazing. And, you know, Leon has the home court. And something you said about the accusations, it's funny because I always see these posts. And I'm not somebody who knows anything about steroids whatsoever. But I always see these posts. The same guys that are accused of steroids all have those weird, like, protrusions in their muscles that I, I don't know what they are. And they all, all the people who are accused, have those similar... I don't even know what to call them on their body. And I, I I don't get it. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the fence grabs and the glove grabbing and the things that were not called on Usman's side, but were called on Edward's side, because there's an article that circulates on YouTube. I don't even know if this is like a reputable, it's a lot of clickbait on this site. So I'm not going to give them like too much credit, but it's at calfkicker.com or whatever. (laughs) I I knew exactly what it was. (laughs) It was popping up on my feed, but I'll, and I'll click it like every 15th time, but, this one was just a montage. It was actually pretty good. A montage of every instance of Usman doing something and not getting called for it. Um, and then, yeah, like you mentioned, he, he resets them in the position the one time that he did it. So I'm going to couple that with moments before stepping into here. I'm watching MMA Hour, and Paulo Costa is talking to Errol Hawani about Jason Herzog deducting a point away from him uh, for the first eye poke in the Marvin Vittori fight. And he said that Jason Herzog confronted him about it, like, um, I guess, in passing during fight week or whatever. And he's like, you know, I just want to understand your perspective on it. And Paulo told him, he's like, look, you took it away the first time. It, it was an accidental eye poke. You took away the point, the first instance of a foul. He's like, I didn't see you do that in any of these other fights. 
And I've never seen it done it before ever. And uh, Herzog said, according to Paulo Costa on the MMA Hour moments ago, he said, according, he said that Herzog said, um, I was trying to balance the fight out. Wow. Can you believe that? I mean, that is a, no. that's a smoking gun if I've ever heard one. That I mean, it's like that case, not that we any, anybody thought these guys were deities, but it's like these refs are human. They go yep. into these fights with their own preconceived biases and their own preconceived understanding of who's going to win. And especially the champions – the two that come to mind the most are Adesanya and um, Usman. Adesanya for different reasons, but it's like they kind of come in and they have this extra power up where they are allowed to sort of, in the judge's eyes and the ref's eyes, get away with these um, kind of like infractions. It's almost like in basketball when a guy tra- when LeBron travels like yeah. steps and the refs like that's poetic license. He who, yep. do we know the game or does LeBron know the game? He didn't travel. Like you know, what I mean, it's it's getting yeah, crazy. That's exactly it. And the thing is, is like that whole you got to take it from the champ. That's crap. Like, mm. okay, so if that's the case, then in every fight that I'm the underdog, do I have to beat the favorite two to one? Like, no, I just got to win. You know what I mean? Like, I hate that. I think they go in with that mindset of like, well, he's the champ. He's got to take it from the champ. That and like, where does it say in a referee? If you look up referee on the internet, I can't find anywhere where it's going to say, make the event more entertaining. And right. if there's ever proof that they're fallible humans, I mean, we all are, but that like they play into the crowd and stuff, watch the Apex fights. All I said, all quarantine was like, this is a grappler's paradise because they're not standing anybody up because there's no crowd going. So they're not going, oh, man, these people hate me because they want me to stand it up, yada, yada. Nope. There was none because there was no crowd. It's not their job to make it entertaining, which honestly, they, he actually did. Uh, was it Herb? I can't remember. Whoever stood, whoever was the main event did stand them up off the fence very, very early in that fifth round, which probably led to uh, – like they were on the wall for like 15, 30 seconds tops. And they were like, all right, all right out in the middle, guys. Come on, you got to work. It's like, that's not your job. That's not your job. Your job is to make it a fair fight, and you're not even doing that. So why don't you just worry about the fouls instead of, uh, you know, making it fan friendly, which you know is not your job. And who cares about the drunk audience? Let them boo because it's like these fights going longer. They're gonna buy more beer. They're gonna be bored in their seats. They're gonna be like, ah, oh, another beer, another beer. And yep. then you make more money as a stadium. So but at the same time, these guys, they're not necessarily getting paid all that much, um, you know, by the commission. I, I think I read somewhere once that Herb D made $1,600 for officiating a Conor McGregor fight where he made like $120 million. So like, you know, at the same time, it's just like when, you're, um, when your little league ref comes there drunk and is calling strikes all over the place. It, it, it's like the same thing. And, and that's why Dominic Cruz got so mad at... Uh, Remind me, it's short fuse. Oh, uh, uh not Jim, short fuse, Keith Peters. Uh, short fuse, <laughs> Keith Peters, right? Isn't that his name? No nonsense. No, no nonsense. nonsense. No nonsense. Did I already tell the story on here about Herb Dean coming up to me like five minutes before my last fight? Yeah, yeah, you okay. did. Yeah, dude, the guy looks like he just rolled out of bed. Not to like, I don't want to be the Dominic Cruz in this scenario, but you're like, hey man, like, come on, what are we doing here? Well, no, you said that afterwards. We were like, man, Joe got got gave us the inside baseball on that on that one. We, I was like. <laughs> I was like, that's hot. That's hot. A uh, hot take right there. Um, so yeah, I mean, the thinking. You know, the last thing I want to say about the Leon Edwards fight, you know, John Anik teed it up so perfectly with what he said right before, where he they were all like, like they said, they were writing his obituary. John Anik tees it up. He's like, that's just not the type of guy Leon Edwards is. Boom! If you go back and watch, the second he says that, lands the head kick, uh, knocks him out. Last thing I'll say is like, yo, if I'm Leon Edwards, I'm gonna try to get in there as quick as possible. Usman will not be able to get in there as quickly as I will want him to if I'm the Jorge Masvidal, baby. And we get Masvidal in there. And I don't care. I, I get told, don't care. I say, I don't care if he just lost. I want Masvidal on a silver platter. You know why? Because that's what Bisping did. Bisping got it. Bisping got it. He got to say, I want Dan Henderson. And, yep. and you know what? Yep. And that's who we got. That being said, Dan Henderson was coming off a win. If you remember, he, he KO'd mm. uh, Hector Lombard right. with that thick elbow. So it's kind of justified. But yeah. And if not Masvidal, give me Colby Covington. You know what I mean? Uh, no, that's a terrible matchup for him. That's a terrible matchup. I mean, is it as bad as Usman? <laughs> I'd say worse. I'd say worse because Usman, it's like yeah. it's like that um uh the meme from Spider Man where he's like, I'm somewhat of a scientist too. Like <laughs> once a grappler gets a knockout, they're like, oh, I'm somewhat of a striker too. So so Usman kind of fell in love with his hands a little bit, I would think. Not that he really portrayed that much in the fight, but. Once you have that confidence in knocking somebody out like Jorge Masvidal, you're like, oh, who's Leon Edwards? Leon Scott, like you're Colby Covington or something. So I, I don't know. I, I think that all grapplers fall into that folly where 
they get their first knockout and then they fall in love with their hands and then they're a lot more confident standing up. And it's like Leon Edwards said, he's like, yeah, he's a great boxer, but this is mixed martial arts. And we're using all, all the weapons that we possibly can. And that's how I got him caught. How disrespectful to be if George St. Pierre is like, you know what? I'm going to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought George St. Pierre would ruin Kamara Usman from the start. Like no, I mean, GSP is the goat. But if, but if I'm Usman, that's the one elephant in the room that he never really said, which, you know, too much homage to GSP. He should have been sitting there saying, hey, they say it's either me or GSP. Well, guess what? George was willing to come back and fight old drunk one-eyed Bisping. He was willing to go down and fight little boy Khabib. But guess what? He ain't willing to come to 170 where he originally was, and that's because I'm here. And that's what he should have been saying the whole time. But that never really came out of Usman's mouth. That might have pulled GSP into the fire a little bit. That might have gotten GSP up for that, you know. And then Usman versus GSP in Canada would have been the best. But if He's I'm too ever- busy watching Aliens, my man. Yeah, if I'm Edwards, I'm going to say, I want GSP. I'm going to make it right for Bisping. And it would have been much cringier when this one said it than how you just said it, which was a great promo. I know, I know. I, I, these guys need writers. I would, I would happily do it. Go, go. If you need a writer, I got you, buddy. All right, all right. But I'd have to, I'd have to really like adapt to do a different character. I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to be like, all right, I got to put myself in the, in the white hat for Joe. I can't, I can't do, can't do black hat stuff. All right, but either way. We got a, a, a matchup, UFC Paris. We're going to do early predictions for this. Joe, however much you got time for, I know you got to teach class coming up. But before we get into that, I got to mention, All In Grappling, you just had an event. I buried the lead here. That was supposed to come at the top of the show, but Leon Edwards bumped you. <laughs> How did it go? I, I saw some of the people who were competing, and you had everybody from, I mean, people were coming down from Tom Blass's gym, it looked like, from Jersey, all the way down to North Carolina. It looked like you had over 100 people, 117 registrants I'm seeing here. Uh, how did it go? Dude, it was awesome, man. It was it was good. Uh, my biggest thing was like, uh, I wasn't, I see, I didn't think anybody was going to come. So like my whole, even when people, it was 133 registered, I think 130 showed up to compete. And uh, it was like, man, I was like, uh, I still can't picture it being anything other than me sitting there in a gym with Matt's down being like, I swear I thought people were going to come. So when, uh, when they showed up, it was like, then my, my whole mindset went from like, Oh my gosh, I hope the fire marshal doesn't shut us down because the building was like max, max occupancy 143. And we had like 133 competitors, well over 100, 150 spectators during the day. And I was like, oh man, this was a success. You know, it was awesome. Uh, the best, the best story of the day, and this sums up probably the entire event, was um, a little girl went out on the mat against this like big muscular kid, same weight class, but, uh, you know, he was like a real athletic kid. And she looked at him and like, from what I was told, I didn't see this, but this was told to me by a couple of people. And she looked at the kid and was like shaking and like, like, oh, I've lost, you know? And he took a sloppy shot. She caught his neck in a guillotine and choked him, submitted him and then cried tears of joy. And I was like, when somebody told me, I was like, yep, that's why we did it. Awesome. Like worth it. You know, um, dude, it was crazy. And then, so, okay. Daytime went on. It was awesome. Had some good matches. Really cool. All the gyms in Wilmington came out. We had people come down from New York. Uh, my buddy's gym, Glory Martial Arts Center. He brought two guys down. Uh, the De Blas affiliate is actually, I think, in town here. I think they switched affiliates. They were under. No, that's my mistake. So that, I, I was confused about that, too. And then I recognized the guy. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it now. But uh, we had a bunch of people from Charleston, South Carolina, Charlotte, all over. And uh, it was pretty cool. And then we, we shut down for the afternoon. Uh, it was like, man, we were done, soup to nuts, done in four hours. We started at 11 a.m. on the button, and then uh, from rules meeting to, to last match, 3 p.m., we were out of there. Um, I think it was 2.59 the last match ended. So I was like, okay, cool. So I'm like, all right, well, you know, none of these people are going to come back at night, and, you know, hopefully the, the super fights go well, which is the event that you guys sponsored. And, uh, you know, it was crazy. People started coming early. All the competitors showed up. Um so I had this idea to start it off and like do it like pride used to do it back in the day where like all the athletes would come out ahead of time first and get announced and like get to see the crowd and the crowd would get to see them before they come out for their match. And my runners that like had them in their locker rooms kind of messed up like the call and none of the guys knew where to go. And I was like, Oh, this is ruined, you know? And then they kind of line up on the mats and then my wife can sing. So I was going to have her sing the national anthem. And I was like, Oh, this is stupid. And then she like, she sang the national anthem. Like I'd never seen it. And this packed, soccer place the soccer field lost their minds lights were out just like that mood lighting it was the coolest thing ever and then that set the whole tone for the night i've never seen better jiu-jitsu matches at like a local super fight event 
um, which a lot of people were saying, like, this matchmaking, I'm like, oh, it was really complicated. I took people that were the same weight and the same belt and put them with each other. Like, we didn't have, we didn't have a ton of people applying. It wasn't like I was like, we need that guy, you know? It was just like right place, right time. Um, dude, it, was, it had to be 250 plus spectators um, at night, too. So the way I compared it was like the last scene in It's a Wonderful Life where he's like, people just burst through the door and start putting money on the table and being like, we're here to support you. I'm like, how the heck is there this many people here to support local jiu-jitsu? It was awesome. So uh, really, really cool. Um, yeah, it was awesome. There's definitely going to be, I wasn't sure what I was going to do going forward. Like if you're just going to do super fights, a little simpler than having the tournament, all that. And after seeing the turnout, all that, like there's definitely going to be a second regular tournament, super fights, probably going to use the same venue next time and do it in like mid to late January or maybe fe early February. Wow, that's awesome. And with a name like All In, you know the PPP boys are all in because, you know, gambling, MMA, jujitsu, we both trained. Sadly, I had to leave uh, John Hassett's school just because I uh, moved to the Poconos recently. So I'm looking for a new school right now. If anybody's on the market, hit me up. You know me in the DMs. You're yeah. under King. <laughs> well, but, uh, you know Joe, as, as somebody who's put on live events in college, it's like, I know exactly what you're going through, where you're just sitting there going like, no one's going to show up to this. I'm going to be sitting there embarrassed, wondering what I could have done differently. And then for people to actually show up, it sounds like more people came out to support you. I put on a concert for one of like my fraternity's close friends, and I couldn't even get guys in my frat to show up and roll out of bed to walk down the street. So, and I mean, you know. Because Luke it's, sings. He's actually a really good singer. No, no, I'm not a singer. You want to sing I, a I, little? I, I can do a national anthem. I can do a national anthem, though. But I won't, I won't take uh, <laughs> I won't take your wife's spotlight on that, but I do have a <laughs> point, though. So, Joe, we have a Patreon, as you know, because that's where the money came from to sponsor the event. So, you know, we've been giving more of that Patreon money away than we've taken out of it. We sponsored, we gave it to, like, an orphanage in the Ukraine uh, or awesome. something. We we gave you the, the money for the event, and we just want to make, make sure that we support people up along the way because we're trying to, you know, just make sure that we... Uh, we, we Show them the, the boys with the boxing gloves. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I have it right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny. We heard some. Uh, yeah, my my buddy worked in Poland for uh, Lockheed uh, Martin I during I, like. I that one yeah. Oh, okay. During like uh, all the Ukraine drama, and he had a bunch of kids uh, that were just like refugees in Poland because of everything going on, and he was like, "Help us get them some footballs, some so, you, you know, uh, PlayStation, whatever." And he he told us about a few kids that wanted some boxing gloves. And uh, they got some boxing gloves. They got all the boxing That's equipment. Awesome. We sent them a bunch of money. It was great. I wish I had the picture because he sent us a picture of the two kids with the gloves. And they're on concrete. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> crazy, I'm like, we don't need a world star hip hop. Uh, and you, yeah, know. you know, they were going like they were trying to knock each other out. The one sure. kid's stance was like way better than my own. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it looked like Lomachenko out there. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really crazy. cool. So though. we're trying to do big things with the money but that being said we're closing in on 50 patrons in our patreon right that's great. and we promised a big thing when we hit 50 so what has dan and i wrestling what has been promised to our audience is a wrestling match between alex and our usual trio uh dan who is the one who called you joe lasucky and i'm going to avenge your honor <laughs> so alex and dan when we hit 50 they're going to do a wrestling match and uh what better venue to do this wrestling match oh. than north carolina all-in grapplings event in All grappling too. Yo, 100 percent done, 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 done. We'll That's go amazing. North Carolina. We'll vlog. We'll do the whole thing. We'll bring these boys out of the match in singlets, folk style rules. That's amazing. 100 percent. And we'll tell the background. That's awesome. Let's see if Dan watches this episode because I'm not even gonna tell him. I'm just gonna we're just gonna keep telling him the date of the match and I'll be like, right, going on vacation. It's fine. We're going on a. Uh, we're gonna go. He's gonna get two plane tickets in the mail because I'm bringing his girlfriend out too to watch him get his face rubbed in the mat. Oh no, she'll she'll, oh, call, right, she'll call the match off before it even happens. She'll call that's the match off before it even happens. That is yeah. amazing. Yeah, and that's All good. Right. Number two will be better because the production will be better. We'll have. I did the filming myself, like on the tripod. We had some commentary, but. We need it. We're going to have like the crew there this next time. And like, now that we know we have proof of concept, there's going to be people there. We're like, we're doing it right. Like it's going to be, so that'll be good. And our MC that announces it, will have a blast with that. That'll be fantastic. That's perfect. And uh, Alex, don't worry if Dan beats you by somehow, by hook or by crook, I'll come in with a steel <laughs> share. Come over the top and we'll give the people a real show. We'll give the people a real show. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, real quick, while we still have Joe, let's get his thoughts on UFC Paris. These are just the quick thoughts. Uh, me and Alex will go into the whole card in more detail. But in the main event, I mean, it seems cut and dry. Cyril Gon versus Tai Tuivasa. 
I think this one's going to be the main event domination that we all thought Usman might be. I mean, not us, because we trolled be served by Dan Edwards, but a lot of people were thinking that uh, it was just a mismatch in terms of skill. If you thought that about Usman Edwards, you're definitely going to think of this in terms of Ghan and Tuivas, I think, because you don't get more of a polished technical athlete than Ghan. You don't get more of a barn brawler than Tuivasa. Um, I got Cyril Ghan all the way in his home country on this one. Uh, you know, the odds aren't great on him, but that's going to be my pick. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think I think the same thing. I think if he can go with Francis, who can set up those power shots a lot better than uh, Tuivasa can, aside from something crazy, which we know can happen, uh, I think obviously I got to go with uh, with Gon because he looked he looked incredible in the Francis fight. A little tentative, but uh, he looked technical everywhere, other than going for that stupid leg lock. But uh, if it wasn't that, he'd be the world champion right now. So you know, I, I got to go with him. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with you guys. I mean. The line is crazy on this one. I'm not necessarily going to be putting my life on it. Um, but Bam Bam, it, people forget. Like, yeah, although he hasn't really had the most impressive wins in the last few fights, Derek Lewis is no slouch, and neither is Andre Olowski. He's still getting it done as an old man in the game, and he beat him in 2018. So, um, I mean, Andre Olowski is one of is probably my favorite heavyweight. Him and Alistair Overy, my two favorite heavyweights of all time. Um, I think Bam Bam isn't getting the right shake here. I think that he has the nuclear option. He can put anybody away. This is going to be five round affair. Um, he, he, he sucked Derek Lewis into his game, whether it was by getting rocked or not. Um, I think, I think he can do the same thing. These Aussies are tough, but I'm going to roll with Bong Gammon. The, the, what is that? The gentleman, the good guy. Uh, I think it means the gamer. No, no, no. He's a gamer. No, he plays video games. (laughs) No, he is a gamer. He is a gamer. He's like 50. He's top 50 in the world in FIFA, which is insane. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not an easy game to be top 50 in. (laughs) No, it's not. It's not an easy game to be top 50 in your university. (laughs) You know what I mean? But um, here's the thing, though. Ty is going to put himself in the right positions. Um, Whereas Lewis is kind of a possum guy. Uh, Nganu, we've seen him kind of freeze up especially being that Ngannou was going into a knee surgery after that, I think. Right. And like, he, I think it it was already kind of messed up going into the fight. He said, and, and so it's like, we're like tear it apart with that leg lock. I don't even care. Like like, Ty Tuivasa didn't get them. Isn't going to get the memo that he's supposed to go in there and lay down. You know what I mean? And that's what kind of makes me nervous about this kind of fight. But um, it's like, you have that option to hedge out on Ty as an underdog. If you make it to the top of your parlay and that's the last fight, you can always hedge out, but it's like, Ty is going to put himself in all the right positions. He might not be able to get knocked out by what Surreal is putting out. Surreal, yeah, he can, yeah. you know, he can stay behind that Philly shell and that jab, but he's not like going out there except for those elbows. Uh, that might be his path to victory, actually, in the clinch because he's going to tower over Ty and he could probably shuck him and, and and make some elbow action happen there, or something in tight. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I think Ty could eight inch reach advantage. <sighs> yeah, it's interesting that I'm thinking though that he could probably get him get the better of him. I think if they're if they're at distance and Ty comes rushing in, that's when Gon I think is most apt to get caught with something. But does anybody right. know the cage size in France? Oh, we, we've never been there, right? For yeah. the UFC, this is not a pay per view, so probably what is it? Is that 30? 28. 28? Either that's way, small. these guys are gonna make these guys are gonna make it seem like they're fighting inside of a dog pen. I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be <laughs> yeah. these boys are big. Which is crazy. Um, I fought in DC and that cage felt gigantic. It was only a fight night cage. And then you watch heavyweights, like, that's a phone booth. It's crazy how gigantic they are. Yeah, and then you see the regional promotions, and the heavyweights are almost knocking the cage over. I mean, yeah. you're, 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 we're the only ones that bolt that thing down. But, um, all right, so it sounds like we're all on the same page there. Giving Ty a shot, but it's going to probably be the hometown guy. Um, Robert Whitaker, Marvin Vittori. This one's more most interesting to me. Um, Vittori's coming in here a dog, guys. Uh, I don't see it that way. I, I see Vittori as the bigger, more athletic, more dangerous – um striker in this in this i mean i know robert whitaker's you know the karate guy but i think vittori just is going to present a lot more danger in there than whitaker who's fought as low as 170 i don't think vittori's making 170 um i thought Vittori looked better against adesanya both times he fought him and to me vittori king's mma uh he's going into paris um just keep him away from the wine until after the fight but you know marvin likes the wine too just like paulo but we need uh we i don't know we i think vittori gets done as an underdog here Oh man. Good. Okay. Um, I I couldn't disagree more, honestly. I think Bobby Knuckles is a bad man. And I should preface this by saying Luke hates Bobby Knuckles. 
Luke does not like the Reaper. Luke does not like Robert Whitaker at all. He thinks he's a nerd. So I'm <laughs> I'm rolling with Bobby Knuckles strong here. I thought the last fight against Israel Adesanya could have went literally either way. So I I don't it's it's another one of those scenarios where you got to beat the champ to be the champ, right? I thought that Robert Whitaker did enough at the end of the day. And I think that Yoel Romero is a much bigger grappling threat than Marvin Vittori. I, I don't think any Italians know how to wrestle except for uh, the, the dude who always, uh, Iron, uh, um, who, who the guy who always wrestles German Burroughs, uh, his name's like Chianzo or some shit like that. I, I'm not entirely sure his name, Frank Camazzo, <laughs> Frank Camazzo. That's his name. Yeah, there we go, baby. Um, <laughs> That's the only Italian I know that knows how to wrestle. I don't even think he's from there. I think he just had like, you know, like uh, the Olympic stuff where you can transfer mm -hmm. over with nationalities. So I'm going with Bobby Knuckles here. I think the Reaper has a lot more in him. And I think that even it, 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 this might be one of the weird scenarios where he might have to fight Israel Adesanya a third time. Gosh. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm so torn now because it, it's so weird because when you think of re, like recency bias, you're like, okay, Vittori is a little nuts so he's gonna go after Adesanya you know he came in and you go okay well Whitaker's a pretty decent counter striker as well but if the shots I think Israel's a way better counter striker and he's not knocking Vittori out uh Whitaker got started kind of slow against Adesanya but is he just doing that because he already fought him he's been knocked out by him but it's a three-round fight right because the main event was mm -hmm. gone yeah I take Vittori just on pressure I think I think in a five-round fight I would take Whitaker because it's more time he can start slower feel him out uh, I think I'm gonna take Vittori just because I think pressure. I think he's gonna just get on it right from the gate because he's a little nuts. Like a Marab situation where yeah. Jose Otto. I don't know. Like Whitaker's a good wrestler to hang with him, but I don't know if he's gonna take him down and keep him down because even taking Adesanya down, he took him down but he popped right back up. So it's not enough to do anything on the ground where he may have an advantage. I think uh, Vittori's so strong. He's so big. Uh, I mean, think about the way he took Adesanya down the first time was just literally out muscling him like he'd have a body lock and just toss him to the floor you know he wasn't doubled on the hips or uh, on the knees he's on the hips and just doing things wrong and kind of ragdoll him so who do you uh, think's the I better think, grappler out of uh robert whitaker and I, israel Desanya? or i would think whitaker like if we're talking mm -hmm. about submission game but i think on the cage and uh in the clinch I'm, i would take Vittori just on side that he's more well, technical I was saying between uh, Bobby Knuckles and Israel Adesanya. Oh, I think definitely, uh, definitely Whitaker. Yeah, but see, it's about that transition time. So it's like I don't. You're right. I don't think Vittori is going to pick Bobby Knuckles up, walk him to the center of the cage, and drop him to the center of the cage three times and win a three round decision off of strictly grappling. But I think that his physicality, combined with his stubbornness and his forward pressure, is going to put Robert Whitaker in a situation where all things equal, the striking that Whitaker is going to put out, Alex, isn't going to be enough in the judge's eyes to make that much more of a difference over Vittori pushing him against the fence for two minutes here, maybe getting a takedown for a couple seconds there, getting some ground and pound. It's going to be a I think Robert Whitaker knocks him out, though. You really think that? That's crazy. I yeah. Think. Like, I think Robert Whitaker has a good chance of knocking him out in this fight. Dude, Vittori is way too stubborn. Vittori is just, he is... Is he more stubborn than Kamaru Usman? And is Robert Whitaker a better striker than uh, Leon Edwards? Put it this way. We saw what Vittori did to him. Mario Usman's a better Costa. wrestler than Vittori for sure. What does what that Paulo Costa do to Robert Whitaker? The Paulo Costa that fought Marvin Vittori at 225 pounds. Mm -hmm. Robert Whitaker's not weighing 225 this side of Easter. True. You know what I'm saying? So it's <laughs> like, we, we got to, I just think that Vittori has had the more, the better strength of schedule, even though that Robert, Robert's been active and stuff. I just think that you look at that Kelvin Gastelum fight. I don't know. I, I don't, I think this is a bad matchup for Robert Whitaker. So I'm taking the underdog. Happy to do it. And, yeah, but uh, Marvin didn't have to deflate himself just because, you know, um, Polo Costa pushed the weight back up. So, yeah, he might have deflated himself a bit, but on Wednesday, he knew that the fight wasn't going to be at 185. Listen, so, you're, you're too close to the forest to see the trees. You love Robert Whitaker, um, you know. And you I, hate him. <laughs> I, I don't hate him, dude, but I, I just, uh, I'm just liking the story. This All right, I'm, fair enough. Fair you enough. Know, uh, but we got, this is another interesting one. Even money fight. Alessio Di Chikorico versus Roman Kapalov. Um, the lasting memory that stands out in the Roman Kapalov fight is him against Duri, uh, Albert Duryev. I just remember him kind of looking like he was very accepting of the bottom position in that fight. Um, still slinging it out. Good display of grit, but got bullied in there against Duryev. 
Whereas Chikariko, this guy, I mean, he, from his post-fight interviews to his pre-fight stuff, everything this guy's saying, he's always, like, angry about, like, other guys not getting interviewed when they lose and stuff. He's, like, he's always saying wild shit, and he's, like, kind of a head case, like, even in the way they fights, and that, you know, we'll have these great performances against guys we respect. Joaquin Buckley comes to mind, knocks him out with a head kick in the first round back in 2021, then goes and gets head kicked in the first round by Abdul Razak Alzan, who we also respect. But a decision loss to Zach Cummings before two decision losses prior to that, then a split decision win against Julian Marquez. Dietrich Rico is all over the place um, in my mind. I don't know which Dietrich Rico I'm going to get here. Um, I, I'm going to I'm I'm going to take Roman Kapalov here as a slight underdog, even though I don't think his last performance was all that great, and I think he's got a lot less experience. And I expect Dietrich, if Dietrich Rico comes in at his best, I think he wins here. But I I just think that something about Roman Kapalov's losing streak is going to it's going to make him the hungrier dog in this situation. I think I'll take Di Ch- Uh just from the ones I've seen. I'm not as familiar with Roman, but uh, I think he's just he's just wild. You know what I mean? I think if it was somebody that wasn't on a losing streak, I would go like uh, Alisson or, uh, you know, they, I don't think he's in danger of getting finished when he gets reckless. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So uh, I think he can be how nuts he is and go wild and let loose. And when he does that, you know, he either wins big or loses big. So gun to my head, I would take him, but I'm not confident in that pick. Yeah, I'm also going to take D Chirico here. Uh, I know I went France against an Aussie, took France. I know I went Aussie against an Italian, and I took the uh, Aussie in this one. And now I'm going Italian against a Russian. This is not something I'd usually do. The Russians are amazing at wrestling. They're the second best wrestling country in the entire world, except for the U S of a. And um, I'm going to go with the Italian here. I, th- I think he really gets it done. He's got almost double the amount of fights. He's only a year older. Always fear the young veteran. Uh, I, I think Alessio Di Chiricho gets it done. This guy doesn't have the threat to knock him out really quick. And I feel like that's a way that he usually loses a fight. Yeah. He has a few I, I, decisions. He has a few decisions though. Yeah, no, no. It's it, he's. I think he's definitely the more fast switch guy compared to Kapalov. I think Kapalov could blanket him with a lot of pressure. Um, and, he, and uh, but yeah, Kapalov's not the wrestling type of Russian though, Alex. So. He isn't. He isn't. Um, all right. He's more of a zip beat. <laughs> we got a couple more main cards to get into here. Um, Nazareth Hopcross taking on John McDessey. and to me, I wrote down uh, some notes on this one, guys. I I got uh, Nazareth all day. He's definitely impressed us. He's definitely somebody to watch from that region. But for me, the the thing is the age. I mean, he's uh, fighting a guy who's 37, hasn't fought in a year and a half. And now he's going to another country. Um, I just don't think he's going to travel well. I think Nasty Nas is usually on the road, so he's used to this type of thing. Uh, we know he fought valiantly in bad situations, so give me Nasrat. One of the locks of the night for me. Yeah, I think the same. I think Nasrat, uh I don't... Uh... Joe, you're muted. Your audio cut uh, out. Ah, okay. That's why I plugged into the charger. You got me now? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I think Nazarat, I think, uh, I said McDessie's a good fighter. He's super technical, but I think the pressure will be too much. I think he needs time and space to get what he needs to do done, you know? He mm. tends to go to decisions and kind of – paces himself pretty well. He's got some good, you know, spinning kicks and stuff like that too. But I think the pressure from Nazrat's too much. Cause I remember actually watching him a good bit, uh, McDessey thinking we were on the same card on one of the times. And I was like, that's somebody I may see, but I like that matchup for that reason. I thought I could pressure him, you know? So I think, I think it's similar. Um, I'll go Nazrat. Yeah. I'm taking Nazrat as well. Make it double P J S certified. A couple of the perfect parlay boys and then Joe Selecki. We're, we're all agreeing here. I, I think this is a pretty cut and dry one. This guy lives in Canada and he can't go to TriStar, but this guy's, what is he from Iraq, right? Uh, yeah, I think Afghanistan. Afghanistan. I, Afghanistan. Um, he's, he's from Afghanistan. He made the trip to TriStar. This guy lives in Canada and he couldn't even make it there. Nazareth all, the, all day, all night, every single time. 
Sweet. And then, you know, this next fight, to me, um, it's a kind of unknown guy coming out of MMA Factory. We haven't seen him in the UFC yet. He's making his debut. And the, what I like about Taylor Lapalus is that, you know, his last fight was a main event headlining in his country in a promotion that, um, or I'm sorry, yeah, also, he was also fighting for the same promotion that Charles Jordan uh, headlined, TKO. So I like when I see that. He was headlining in his last fight recently, last April. He's coming in against Khalid Taha off a win against an undefeated guy. Uh, 11 and 0. Khalid Taha, I feel like I've liked him in the past during the pandemic. We've bet on him. We've picked him in certain spots. Um, he's definitely, I think, you know, a, a better fighter than he's shown us in his last couple of fights. But I just think, you know, he's going to come in a couple beats behind the hometown guy. Um, not too much research, not too much tape study. Going to have to get into Mr. Taylor as the weeks go on. But as of right now, not liking what I saw against Morozov, not liking what I saw against Honey Baloney. So give me Taylor Lapillus uh, over Khalid Taha. Yeah, I'll take Taylor uh, Lapilus here. I mean, he has some UFC level experience. Right, he's the number one fighter out of France, number one ranked fighter out of France, the number one ranked fighter out of Canada. Yeah, well, the French are cowards. And the number they, one they ranked fighter. They retreat. The number one ranked fighter out of Western Europe. Okay. Western Europe. Yeah, I think I think the same. I think th I think there is something to be said for. Again, you have to look at who's the opposition and what they're coming off of. But you know, if it's if it's Lapilus versus Jim Miller. Then yeah, I'm going. Jim Miller can go into France and fight the guy and not be phased by that. But I think where the opposition's at in their career, and then you have the hometown guy, it's such a toss up. I think you'd be foolish not to take the hometown guy. So yeah, I go with him. Sometimes we just gotta put our team full hats on and go. Who does the UFC want to win here more? Right? Do they want the guy from France to make his debut in his home country, win over the entire viewing audience at home and the people there live, or do they want Kalita, who's on a two fight skid, hasn't won a fight in a very long time, probably on his way out the door? Um, I'm not saying that, you know, anybody's poison and anybody's water over here, but I'm just saying at a certain <laughs> point, you've got to kind of look at the invisible hand that's kind of guiding the thing and say, all right, this is a winnable fight for Taylor Lopez. And guys, I don't know if you know this. He went three and one in the UFC from 2015 to 2017. Uh, this guy, Lapice. And he also beat Nate Maness before he got up here in a card that was headlined by Cyril Gan, And then he beat Wilson Reyes, who was a title contender at Featherweight. So he, or, uh, flyweight obviously he has some real ufc experience i think he's gonna go out there and get it done amazing well we got one more fight on the main card joe you got to teach soon i'm assuming you got to get going but uh, uh, i'm good till to... seven i'm good i'm good till like right, 6 50 yeah well, I awesome. Awesome. well we'll keep you here as long as you got time for us and uh this last fight on the main card is a fight that i mean i think it's gonna be one of the best fights of the night you got nathaniel wood taking on charles jordan and I've been waiting for an opportunity to bet against Nathaniel Wood because he comes in every time on these hometown England cards, minus 400, minus 500, because all of the fans are so excited to have Nathaniel Wood back. They bet him. They bet him, bet him, bet him. And he showed in his last fight. I mean, that line was outrageous, and it was a closer fight than the line indicated. So I, I've been waiting for my opportunity to bet against Nathaniel Wood at these juicy, juicy odds. But, of course, now he comes in, he's the underdog against a guy who I have a ton of respect for, Charles Jordan. Charles Jordan who has had some pretty epic performances lately. He's been up and down since the pandemic. Rocky start to the UFC, but honestly, he's looking the best he's ever looked recently. Um, I'm going to fade Nathaniel Wood. I just wish I was getting an underdog in this situation. I'm picking Charles Jordan. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think Jordan just off the last performance. I think although he lost, I think he's riding the momentum of arguably almost beating Shane Burgos, you know, a fight of the night type performance where you're like, in my opinion, he's going to leave that going, okay, like if he had any questions, he's like, I'm a top 15 guy. I belong here. Not a chance. You know, I think he's just too well-rounded. I think uh, he was in some really sketchy spots and he showed how well-rounded he is. He not only was getting out of bad grappling spots, he was attacking offensively, almost submitting Burgos, putting him in bad spots, touching him up on the feet. Uh, I, I'd be hard to pick against him coming off of that. Yeah, I'm going to disagree. And, um, I think Nathaniel Wood is amazing. I thought his last fight was absolutely great against Charles Rosa. He was kind of playing with his food a little bit. I thought he could have got the finish a couple times in there, uh, but he was kind of hot dogging a little bit. He was, you know, pumping up the crowd, calling on Charles. Um, I just think that Air Jordan is just a little too aggressive for such a crisp striker like Nathaniel Wood, and he has a lot less travel coming from the UK where you know he's flying all the way from canada so or or america if he's trained in america which would be the smart decision but he's french canadian so he knows the language better okay cool be a little bit 
<laughs> no, no. Charles Jordan, I, I don't respect anybody who tries to steal uh, the clout of his airness, which is, you know, Michael Jordan, of course. You're not Air Jordan. There's only one air, and that's Jordan, my man. And um, Charles Jordan, Michael Jordan, he is not. So I'm not. I'm rolling with Nathaniel Wood here. I, I think he looked sensational in his last fight and that he's going to carry this over. And I love taking him as a dog here. All right. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting fight. Um, next uh, headlining fight of the prelims. This is so hilarious because a couple weeks ago we had, um, I think it was uh, Yasmin versus Yasmin, right? And then, you know, last weekend we had Luke Rockhold versus Paulo Costa, the good looking fighter gimmick. And I feel like whoever does the UFC matchmaker making, like they just have moments where they just laugh to themselves in their cubicle <laughs> about like putting Zara Faran on the same card as Faraz Zayam. <laughs> I mean, their names are opposite. It's just you, you can't tell me that they didn't look at that and go, ha, huh, we got Zara Farim on the same card as Faraz Zayam. You can't tell me they didn't see that and go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, they had to have. It has to be by design. I'm just I'm obsessed with it. But just to confuse everybody, we got Zara Faram, not Faraz Zayam. We'll get to him later. But we got Zara Fromm taking on Aline Perez. Now, Aline Perez, she's the number one or number three woman out of all of Latin America. She was on some show that I have to look into because if you look at her profile picture, she's got the blue hair. She's got the bikini. She's on the beach in Argentina. And Love she, Island. She was on a show called Samurai Fight House 4. Now, this sounds, <laughs> this sounds like, uh, like, you know, some animation from Japan, if you ask me. Like, <laughs> else for sounds very interesting. I have to check, take a look, especially if this this beautiful woman was on there with other beautiful ladies. I'm assuming they had to fight it out to see who's going to win. I'm assuming this is like a reality show. Um, but she got a couple good wins. Two wins by finish in Samurai Fight House. Samurai Fight House 3 and Samurai Fight House 4. She was also in Samurai Fight House 1. Must have missed two. It doesn't seem like a reality TV <laughs> show if they're numbered like that. Her only loss was actually at Samurai Fight House 2, and that was by illegal knees in the third round. So not even really a loss, kind of like in the sense that she didn't lose by by getting knee. She lost, got her lost. She, uh, Peter Yan. I mean, if we're going to say John Jones is undefeated, let's just say Alim yeah. Perez is also undefeated. Undefeated. So um, I'm picking her in this fight. You know, she's the number two woman out of Argentina. Um, her opponent, the main reason I'm picking her is because she's 27. Her opponent has not fought in, let's see, I have the written down. Sorry. Her opponent hasn't fought in a long time. Uh, two and a half years. And she's 35. So we're coming in statistically. She's inactive. And she's eight years older. That puts her in a, a statistical win category of less than 35%. So just going with that off of two people I don't really know too much about. I'm going to go with the stats, the odds. I'm going to take Perez. Yeah, I think the timeout and the age, that just sold me. Because I didn't. I'm like, okay, I'm just flipping a coin until you said that. And then... uh that, that's just too much of a gap, I think. I mean, especially I mean, female fighting is tough like that. I mean, I think they're closer to the 55 and 45 and 70 pounders where it's like younger is better for the to an extent. And, you know, you got to think is uh, it's a lot of time out. That's a lot of time out. And then yeah. you got a young fighter with momentum. I think that's a, that's an easy pick at that point. Long time out, home country. She's from France. She's in their packed house. And it doesn't get easier, as you probably know. I mean – Luckily for you, the UFC is not putting any events on in North Carolina this anytime soon. Yeah. But it's like I'm sure you'd have a lot of people hitting you up for tickets. I'm sure you had a lot of people. Oh, 100. percent DC yeah. was like that. It was it was like a wedding. You got to keep track of who's sitting where and everything else. Which uh, I almost was on the Paris card and or I was offered it, and uh, that would have been nice to not be near anybody that needed tickets. So like, oh, I'm across the world. So yeah, I mean, the only thing wrong with that is I just can only imagine the nightmare tax situation you would have to be in. To do taxes probably in Paris, in Paris, international. Yep. You know, I mean, I'd be stuffing money in my shirt on the airplane. Just like, Dan, <laughs> just pay me in cash. I'll take it in cash. Yep. But anyway, um, all right. So this next one, I'm actually really interested. Uh, well, in let me talk. actually get my pick first. Uh, right. I will also take Perez. She's way younger. No slouch. Zara Farin. Um, she lost to Felicia Spencer. One of the girls that I – or women that I respect in this division more than anybody, Megan Anderson, she was pretty tough for a while. Um, but if you look at her topology, she pulled out – or no, she missed weight against the outlaw Josie Nunes, which is my favorite women's fighter right now, and then uh, withdrew from Jocelyn Edwards. I think she's out of the frying pan into the fire now, and she'll, she'll pay. 
All right. Um, next, we got a fight at lightweight. So really interested to get Joe's perspective on this one. Um, Benoit St. Denis versus Gabriel Miranda. Gabriel Miranda making his debut, I believe. I thought he was, actually. Um, that was my first instinct. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he is making his debut. And uh, uh, St. Denis will remember as the guy who was in that fight with that ref that, you know, we all, everybody thought the fight should have been stopped because apparently we're all a bunch of babies. But, um, you know, Benoit St. Denis, he's like a special forces agent out of France. He's 9-1 and one with that lone loss coming from that one fight that in question in the UFC where he took a Elysio Zaleski. Yeah, yeah, took a beating against Zaleski, but didn't go down, fought valiantly, uh, made it out and got a rebound win. Knew I was going to pick him in his rebound fight. And I'm going to pick him here. I mean, he's, he's taken on a debutante in Gabriel Miranda. We know debutants lose at a 65% rate. Um, and I think in his home country, you're telling me you're going to, this is like Tim Kennedy in Texas. Benoit St. Denis in France is like Tim Kennedy in Texas. You know what I mean? Like he's going to have, he's going to be uh, overpowered here, you know? <laughs> this will have to be my like last that. one, guys. Uh, Perfect. Perfect but, end on. Couple of so lines. I was, I was offered uh, St. Denis actually. Um, but so I'm, I'm picking him because I think he, I, I think he's a specialist. I think he's really difficult on the ground like that. I think, like you said, debutante in uh, hometown is going to be even, even worse than the standard of losing rate of uh, somebody making their debut. But, uh, He's a tough fighter, man. He's a very good specialist, good grappler, uh, and I think he's going to win. But I would have liked to have been the one fighting him, that's for sure. That's the fight you were offered for this card, yeah. for Paris. Wow. Yeah. So what, yeah. what's it I was, it? was it on their end? I was I was hurt. That's uh, So my manager asked when I thought I would want to fight again. And I was like, you know, my ribs were really, really bad at that last fight. And I was training, but I was all drugged up on, like, uh, I had to get a tortoise shot just to do that stupid grappling tournament. And then uh, – I was on prednisone, all this stuff, and then it came off, and it was hurting again, and I'd have a good day, and then three bad days, and yada, 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 who cares, but, um, so I was like, oh, okay, like, November, I think, would be, would be a safe bet, he's like, all right, I'll tell him, and then, like, three days later, he's like, hey, how does September 3rd in Paris sound, I'm like, it doesn't sound like November, uh, <laughs> and I was like, I wanted to do it, because, you know, the thing is, like, I like the idea of fighting, like I said, like, like for a lot of, like, the debut guy, it's going to be an uphill battle, but I thought, like, going to Paris and fighting the hometown favorite, awesome, uh, like check it off the bucket list type thing. I love the matchup because he's a grappler. And then, uh, yeah. And then I was like, oh man, like there's no way there's any other scenario where I'll be able to take my wife to Paris. <laughs> so uh, I had to tell her and she was not happy about it either. So uh, we're holding out for something in, in October, and November just because I couldn't, I couldn't put together a training camp. There was no way. But what sucks is now I wouldn't be able to make it through a training camp, but now I'm 100% feeling awesome. And I'm like, I probably could have fought this weekend, you know, but uh, I wouldn't have made it through a training camp. So, yeah, that was the fight. Damn, Joe. Dude, you got a pair of big brass balls on you to go into this guy's enemy territory. I mean, like, we, we might as well have just declared war against Paris and just sent you over there. <laughs> what, dude, it was the there? Rocky scenario, man. That's, I grew up on too many movies. I was like, dude, this is perfect, but not meant to be some other time, I guess. Damn. Kudos but. to you for taking it or for at least uh, entertaining it. And uh, good luck at your coaching session right now. Good yeah. luck in your class. Anything else you want to plug? The floor is yours, and we'll be eagerly awaiting your next fight announcement. Yeah, no, I just appreciate you guys, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for supporting the event. Uh, seriously, if you want to do that match on All In 2, that would be awesome. Uh, Joe, I'm ready. Any date, place, as as anytime, anywhere. As soon as I get a fight date, we'll have a date for the second event. But uh, that's pretty much it. I hope you guys uh, hope you guys come down. That would be awesome. So, oh, yeah. yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Talk Thank to you. Yeah, thanks, later. Joe. You appreciate guys. you coming on. Dude, I didn't even know BSD was a lightweight until I just saw it. Because my memory of him is, like, as a fucking 185 or some shit, dude. Like, that guy is a bear. Wait, or so we're not going on to the Patreon today? No, we're just running straight through. Cause I, it dances, I, re I really have to take a, a Uti Uti, a, a Tinky Winky, so to say. All right. Well, could could you take us through the next one? I think it's uh, Joaquin Buckley versus Nazardina Mabal. You, you picked BSD, right? Oh, yeah. I, I guess I didn't get my pick off. Yeah, I'm taking BSD for sure. No doubt, no doubt, dude. He, he, it's special forces. They're gonna. How is this guy younger than Joe too? He looks like he's like uh, when I, my memory of this guy. War torn, and 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 you know they say war torn fighters. <laughs> this is a war torn man. Like he has been through wars. So like you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean Joe absolutely smothers him, but besides I mean, the point. Benoit Denise better based on the Zaleski fight. Huh. I think Joe's hands are better based on the uh, the Zaleski fight. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know? Oh he yeah. Fuck, he did fuck up Nicholas Stoltz though. But listen, I'm literally about to urinate my pants. I need I need a break. And an hour is a long time. Yo, I got some stuff I can talk about. So everybody, thank you for watching. Obviously, we usually do the prelims on the Patreon, patreon.com slash perfect parlay pursuit. Um, but today, Dan, the bet man, is at a wedding in Spain in Madrid. So he's on Spain time. He's over there with his lady flying home tonight. So he couldn't be here. Um, but normally how we do it is main card on the YouTube channel. That's free. We move over to the Patreon, patreon.com slash perfect parlay pursuit. We do the prelims there. And the incentive to do that really is just if you love the show, then you want the prelims, then you support the show. You support the show. It's just for extra content. It's just to help give us some money so we can do fun things like sponsor Joe Selecki's events, like donate to the refugees, the boxing kids, you know what I'm talking about. So we have the Patreon as a, just a mechanism of giving us money. We're not selling t shirts right now, we're not selling mugs. We're just, if you want to help us, 10 bucks a month, gives, it funds the show. It funds the show. And, you know, there's three of us. It's 10 bucks. We're all gambling here. $10 is the absolute minimum I would ever bet on anything. So it's like, if I have money to gamble, I have money extra, go ahead. You support the show. It really helps us just kind of track what we can do with the show over time, having all these patrons. So we're approaching 50. I think we're about five away. And when we get there, the match is on, guys. We're going to use that money. To get me, Alex, and Dan down to North Carolina, we're gonna apparently in front of a live audience have Alex and Dan wrestle. Um, and I mean, I gotta find something for me to do because this is—I can't let the boys have all the fun. I gotta get—I gotta get my hands dirty. If Chase Hooper is in North Carolina in January, then you know, bare knuckle box me in the parking lot. Chase, let's go. We'll 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 get we'll get a separate event going outside. And trust me, in North Carolina, you can do these things. Joe was talking about the fire code and skirting around that. I mean. They do not respect regulations down south. We can do it wherever. We can do it in a hay field. We can do it on the beach. Bare knuckle. The UFC doesn't need to know about it. All cash. Okay. Obviously, just kidding. I think that's like a felony to even offer that. But moving on. These are jokes. Um, Alex will be back soon. He's ta- It seems like he's taking a shit, not a piss. So, you know, we'll, we'll we'll address that when he gets here. But like I said, guys, only pick we got wrong last week, will be certified picks, was Romanoff. Albazi. Gordon, Pedro, Costa, and Leon fucking Edwards should be certified at the top. All got correct. Uh, Woodson, you know, was the, uh, the push. Thank God Saldana threw that flying knee, thank, or that knee to the grounded opponent. Thank God. I think the fight should have been stopped. Should have been a no contest right there. Shouldn't let somebody continue when they've been knocked out like that. Um, but the other picks I got wrong, AJ Fletcher, really good first round. You no, know, um, just kind of got figured out and was almost just on the he, – he found himself – uh, I was just talking about AJ Fletcher a little bit in that Angelusa fight. AJ found himself leading the dance in the first round, but then got hit with a reverse card, and then he was the dance was being led in the second and thirds. You know what I mean? He was leading the dance really well, but sometimes all you have to do is just reverse card him, and now you're leading the dance. You know, it, it's about beats and and rhythm, and it's like if he, if he's getting in his and you're just a beat behind, and now you know what I mean? Then they yeah, play. and I mean the commentators were all over. Uh... AJ Fletcher in the beginning of the fight. Like you heard them, they were like, his counter punching is on point. It's crisp. I feel like they should have stopped that fight when AJ Fletcher was on top, kind of just hammering down. And maybe that's because I, I bet for the under in that one. Maybe, maybe that's why I thought that, but I thought AJ Fletcher was wreaking havoc in that round. Who, who was the, uh, was that Mike Beltron that time? Good question. Um, not sure. I think Mike Beltron ref two in a row, and it was AJ yeah. Fletcher and then Luis Saldana's fight. And you know, so, um, as far as the other two, I got wrong. Jay Perrin, I thought he won. So, or I thought you could make it. I didn't think he won whatsoever, whatsoever. Um, and then you know, uh, Victor Altamirano versus De Silva. You know, yeah, I took the dog first fight of the night. I knew what I was getting into. Short notice. I knew how dangerous Altamirano was, um, but. I still thought Silva looked really good. He almost finished him, you know? And yes. I, I, wish, I wish that Silva was, you know, not going to be – I think he's going to be cut. But I really do like Silva. I, I, Silva. I think that people are giving him a really hard time. He's a young kid. He's going to he's gonna be a fucking stud. He's not going to get cut. He's not going to get cut. Two I think losses. He's gonna cut. Go and get some wins and come back. You know what I mean? But he he's like 0-3, I think. But when you're a, sure, a short-notice guy, they always take that into account. You're a company man. Yeah, very true. Very you're true. willing to get in there. You're willing to get I'm in there against all odds. You have to cut weight on two weeks' notice. Like, it's tough. Fingers. 
He's got stingers. The man, the kid can can crack. Oh yeah, dude. He rocked Victor Aldana early in that fight, and I was, I was worried. I was, I was a little worried. I didn't put too much on Victor Aldana, but I, I had some things, and they all went to shit after Romanov crapped the bed. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, but Luis Aldana, I, I wanted to bring this up. I, I really did. You guys know how much I hate hot doggers, right? Guys who sit around there. Ooh, whippy, whippy Kaye, and then don't finish your fight. If yeah. you're going to hot dog, be a Sugar Sean O'Malley, put the ball between your legs and send his head in, into the canvas. You know what I mean? So for this to happen, for where you rock a guy, first rock before he even hit him with the illegal knee, what did he do? He went out, he raised his arms, he sat down on the ground like he was Nate Diaz or Nick Diaz, and he thought he was all that. He let Woodson recover, then need him in the face. And, and if you remember, when Woodson was talking to his coaches after the fight, um, you could hear it on, you know, when the commentators weren't talking. He was like, wait, so what happened in the first round? Like, they were like, you got rocked, and then he need you in the head when you were on the ground. He's like, no way, dude, that sent me. He was like, I, I had no idea where I was. I had no idea what was going on. I And it, it it's a testament to, like, these guys, they're in there. They have five minutes of recovery time whenever a foul happens. And I think it's absolutely idiotic not to take all five you minutes don't know every was, time. You, If you don't respond in the affirmative, you're running the risk of the ref stopping the fight. So if he says, are you good to But continue? you respond and you're like, yeah, hold on. Give me a second. Yeah, but you don't – he didn't even know where he was. So he was just like, yeah, I'm going to continue. Let's go. Like, I, Yeah, I, yeah, no, 100%. Yeah. 100%. But, but like, like, in a situation with Luke Rockhold when he gets fouled, right, like he should have definitely taken every minute he could have gotten because yeah, obviously he was getting – is, I would say to the ref, I'd say to the ref, go. I would say give me a minute. Go talk to him. And I would even say this. I'd be like, so the crowd doesn't boo. Just go – like, the ref needs to, like, stall more. Because, like, when the ref's, like, going up to the fighter really quickly. Because Marab Davishili can stall for a whole fucking fight and win. The ref's, like, the ref's, like, yo, you, like, he's, like, you got time. You got time. And the fighter's, like, I'm good. I'm good. It's, like, the ref should just be, like, you got time. And then go do a lap, like, around the perimeter of the octagon. Tell the judges what happened. Tell the other fighter to stop talking to his corner. Like, just stall a little bit. Like Get him off of the side of the cage because he thinks he just finished the fight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. Um, Which is a foul within itself. Two points. <laughs> yeah. But I think that there's like the ref's presence can do a lot in those rooms because there's an urgency that I think the ref creates where the guy's like, don't bring in the doctor, let's just go because they don't want the fight to get stopped. You know what I mean? So they're just yeah. like, just go. Like that, and that's what they're trained to do. And that's what they should but, do. But that's just like what Joe was saying. It should never be about the entertainment of the matter. It should be about what's right. Like you're a ref. You're trying to make sure all these fighters are safe. You're trying to make sure the right things happen. If an infraction happens, you got to penalize that. Yes. You, you're not evening out a fight. You yeah. you take it on a case by case. They better basis. follow up with her. Talk about that. They better follow up with him about that. <sighs> they better. They better. I'm sure he's gonna come he out have with no the, knowledge. He should have I'm, no I'm knowledge. I'm sure he's gonna. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's gonna get sucked into an interview with Helen Yi, just like uh, Herb Dean did after his one really bad infraction. He should have no knowledge of the pre-fight stuff. And if you're a fighter, if you're a ref, why are you? You shouldn't. You should be shielding yourself from biasy as if you are trying to prevent yourself from finding out the outcome of a fight because you want to watch it the next day. You yes. should just be like, I don't want to, I don't want to know too much about these guys' personal lives. Cause maybe I don't agree with every fucking thing they say. And maybe it will impact me. You know, I'm not, you know, because guess one, what? If you told me Leon Edwards won before the fight happened, like that, that removes everything that went, w- went through it. Like we, we saw Herb Dean rooting against him, just like Herb Dean did against, uh, Colby Covington. We saw all this. We 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 saw it from the start. I don't know, man. I I think a lot of these people are in a lot of each other's pockets a lot more than we realize. And I and I especially really, I think I realize it. And that's a, you know, a, no, but a lot more. Like considering that, you know, Herb D made sixteen hundred dollars to ref a Conor McGregor, um, Conor McGregor fight when he made one hundred twenty two million. Pay per view did. <clears throat> 1.25 million views purchases not just views um okay but it's like 
Yeah, but and, and and the guy playing guitar in the band that's behind Beyonce probably gets fifteen hundred bucks too. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, sometimes no, but that that's what I'm saying. So it's a lot easier for somebody like you know an Ali Abdelaziz, a Paradigm um, employee to be like, hey, I'm going to literally triple your pay in one night if yeah. you just like you know see things a certain way and you know. I'll have my it's, it's, cousin. It's, it's I'll have my cousin wire you the money. Who people don't even know we're cousins. It's probably like an unspoken type of thing, where it's just like. Because still to this day, people don't even know Luke and I are brothers. Still to this day, yeah. I can find numerous people in my family that you wouldn't believe are related to me. You know what I mean? Like if if you don't even think we're brothers, I I can get away with way more. Well. Yeah, I think you're onto something, but it's just it, it's like I said about the fight. It's like who do, who do the who do they want to win this weekend more, Gabriel Miranda or Bene, uh, or uh, or BSD, right? And I'm not, and listen, it's not 100. percent It's not 100. percent But nothing is. It's gambling. We're trying to look for our edges. We're trying to look for our edges, and we don't want to be sitting there going, "Oh yeah, that was stupid." The special, of course, the French special forces guy won in Paris against a guy we've never heard of before because they can just dust anybody off from the fucking regional scene. It's like having a stock pond, like. And there's a stock pond within the UFC too, guys. There's a stock pond within the UFC. GSP told it on the Joe Rogan podcast. He said that he went in and he watched at a very low, a very high frame rate, all of his, all of his uh, opponents' film to study how quick their reaction time was and where the openings would be. And he said out of all of them, BJ Penn had the fastest reaction time, the fastest reflexes. Um, but that, but that being said, it's like yeah. So you think Dana White and all the other high executives in the UFC don't have all of this same footage and they don't sit back on their Tuesday meeting and go. Is that and, and calculate the probability of one fighter winning and, and determining what matchups are more favorable for certain people. I'm not saying it's 100% avoidable at all times. I'm just saying that, like, the writing is on the wall sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And if you don't think so, Harry Hunsucker fought Tyson Pedro fucking last Saturday. So if you Harry, don't think so, then there you go. Tyson Pedro has been like a. Minus 700 favorite in his last five fights. And he comes out and he says, I'm going to give Harry Hunsucker $10,000. Because it's probably going to be his last fight in the UFC. So I'm going to give him 10 grand. I'm going to give him my, a part of my win bonus. And, and it's like, you realize how bad What a great guy. Right? What a great guy. It sounds like he fucking paid him to take a dive. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, I wouldn't have gotten paid from his win bonus if he didn't win. So I guess I got to let him. No, know? but he also saw three Aussies knock him out right before him. So he's like, oh, I got this cake. <laughs> yeah. Cake money. I would be like, keep your fucking money. I'm not, I'm not some rented stripper for you all season, All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go to BKFC now, and, and I'll, I'll make a million something dollars. Else, something else important to notice is that uh, Christos Giagos was the original opponent for Benoit Saint Denis. So, um, you know, maybe I'm a little bit uh, heavy-handed with my attack. They were going to give him a guy with ten losses. So. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is oh, who's right. had five straight losses, straight. four straight losses. The, their original, their original intention was to give him a guy coming off back-to-back first-round finishes with ten losses. Sorry, <laughs> they were giving him a good opponent. Nah, sorry, the original intention was to give him Joe Selecki. So, yeah, true, true. Maybe Joe Selecki would have ruined his whole. No, no, I think actually, I think Joe was probably to replace Giagos. Maybe I don't know. I don't no, know no, 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 no. They, they, they offered it to him before that. That's what he said, I believe. Dude, it's so funny because without us knowing that Joe was offered that fight, we're sitting there, we're going, yeah, it's a special forces guy in his hometown. You'd have to be crazy to fucking fight this guy. The UFC clearly wants him to win right here. Joe's like, yeah, they offered me that fight. I'm like, oh, shit. Ah, <laughs> oh, dude. But no one's better than Joe Salaki. No one. No one. Like, he comes on the show. Gabriel Miranda's and Christos Giagos. But as Joe Salaki's informal manager, I'd like to get him in there against Christos Giagos and Gabriel Miranda. <laughs> you know, what he ain't getting baby the check the check's going clear either way <laughs> you know what i'm saying amen amen, amen. And, and you're on that contract until you know you're done uh, until you get a knockout like Corey masvo and you're like we're renegotiating <laughs> we're not we're not going for the same shit we were going for before Think about scandals we can create around Joe Selecki to, to get him some uh, notoriety. Maybe he can go like, just like we could like uh, I don't know. I'm thinking of like the, the dolly uh, against the bus incident. I'm thinking of Masvidal backstage with Edwards. I'm thinking of 
Miles Brawl running up on Colby Covington. I'm just thinking of all these all these clips of like different. We need to coax Dan into trying to fight him when we go to all in. After after he loses and Joe Selecki refs, we gotta like coax Dan into like trying to fight him afterwards. Yeah, because those Kevin Holland videos go super viral about like uh Kevin Holland beats up a uh, guy who uh, who, Dan who, tries to fight a little girl at all in grappling tournament and then Joe Slucky like stops like that. <laughs> Dan sees a little girl beat a boy and is crying and Dan goes out there and he's like my time to shine now and then Joe Slucky spears him. Oh my god, dude, we could definitely we could definitely at least just like provoke we could create a misunderstanding. With Dan. We could create a That's great. Do you think Dan and I get that headlining? Uh, do you think we headline? Or do you think we like uh, Curtain Jerk? I mean, dude, I think that I think that it's going to be a very special slot. With enough money we put in... <laughs> if we put in enough money to all in grappling, I guarantee we headline. We could change the name to PvP grappling we put enough money in. That's what I was saying. I was like, it should be PP... This is ground level stuff. We could, we PP could, we could... Paulin. PP Paulin grappling tournament. <laughs> No, I, I think that uh, that we could potentially make a big splash. Um, you know, the drama we gotta we gotta definitely get some pre fight footy to present to Joe. On the day I'm gonna paint my face. We gotta say roll this, roll this before the you know like the the um soft cold open, the cold open. It's gonna be like uh the movie Knuckle. Like I'm going to literally have the same production value. I'm gonna have everything. I'm gonna be like in the fucking Bitmans. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna take his head off. <laughs> yeah this is gonna work this is gonna be great a little road trip down to north carolina all right so let's let's get back to business norcal here. norcal 209 four, baby we got four fights left to break down for fine people <clears throat> excuse me nazardina mavov taking on joaquin buckley this is a fight i've gone back and forth on so many times alex i mean it's this fight is going to be to me one of the best fights of the night besides the jordan mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. you know and uh what's his name fight so who do you got here, man? Because I've gone back and forth so many times on this. Because as you guys know, Nazardine Amabov, I've picked him every time he's fought. I've picked him um, since he emerged into the UFC during the pandemic and this podcast started. Um, I picked him first, I think, against Phil Halls. No. The first time I picked him, sorry, was against Jordan, Jordan Williams. Williams. Then Diabetic. against Phil Halls. And he almost knocked Phil Halls out in the third round. I remember being in Hawaii watching that one, I believe. Was I? Wait a minute. February 2020. One. I guess I wasn't in Hawaii when that happened. <laughs> I remember being in Hawaii watching him fight. You were um, in Hawaii when he fought Jordan Williams in uh, October of 2020. Yep, I was. I was in Hawaii when he fought Jordan Williams. Then he fought, and I did the breakdown while I was in Hawaii for the Phil Halls fight, I believe. Wait, no. Uh, no, that's no, because not like, even what? fucking close to you. <laughs> All right. Um, How long were you in Hawaii? For four months, months? Three months? So anyway, two months. So anyway, Ian Heinz. Two months. Howley. <laughs> uh, Edmund Shabazian finishes him. Um, looks great doing it in both those fights. I want to pick um, Nasruddin, MMA Factory, hometown, France. I want to pick him in this bout. But man, Buckley just like looked so good in his last fight against Dario, dude. So it's like a tough one to call for me. I think I'm going to finally just settle with hometown bias and go with Nasruddin Mabo. Yeah, nah. The French are cowards. Uh, <laughs> Checking Buckley is going to go in there and take his freaking head off, dude. And I wanted to take the sniper. Uh, and Luke, you have a mob off on your fantasy team. So Ooh. it makes sense. See, guys, I'm someone who's unbiased. I had Kamar Usman on my fantasy team. You know what I did? I took freaking Leon Edwards. And I put my balls on the table. And I was so close to I, – I was about to start saying, instead of smashing with a hammer, I put him into a blender. But <laughs> after four rounds of the Leon edwards Kamar Usman fight, I was like, I'm just putting him in a blender at this point. There's no – there is coming back from a hammer, no coming back from a blender. I retired. You already know that. I'm back, baby. You can't come back without a retirement. So – I'm going, I'm going with Joaquin Buckley here, the new Mansa. I mean, this guy, he he wins a split decision against the guy who beats the guy who had kicked him in the first round. I'd say that's lucky. His first fight in the UFC, Kevin Holland, tough. Has the most amazing knockout I've ever seen against Impicasagne. Sorry, Joe. 
Um, Jordan Wright, the Beverly Hills Ninja, you know, Antonio Royale was losing that fight. Got, got the finish. Split decisions against al Hassan. Albert Duryev, that's the guy who has the BMW in his picture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the machete. So, uh, I mean, I gotta go. I gotta go with my boy Joaquin Buckley, and and I actually accidentally tuned into one of his Instagram lives the night of the fight, and I thought he was going to be reacting to the fight, but he was just so wired up for his fight this week that I was like, "This is my guy, Joaquin Buckley's going out there. He's getting it done." <clears throat> By hook or by crook, he is going to go out there and probably put this man in a stretcher. He's a dog, and it's like, dude, he really could get that win as a dog. I mean, I went back and forth on it so many times. Um, it is what it is. I'm still waiting for this Joaquin Buckley back kick, you know, uh, remembrance money to come in on him. Like, why is he an underdog right here? Why can't I get my boy Nazardine at the underdog odds? Instead, I got to pay underdog odds for Buckley, who's supposed to be the most famous guy with that viral clip. It's like, Where's the casual money coming in on Buckley? Joaquin Buckley has the frame, the size, and everything, even without the grappling ability, to get Nazardine down. Like, Nazardine has not necessarily faced the best grapplers in the world. His last fight was against Edmund Shabazian. Then he had Ian Heinish. He lost to Phil Halls, a great grappler. One against Jordan Williams. He stalled him against the cage the whole fucking time. He didn't even get him down. Well, you know, some would say uh, somebody did the same thing to Jose Aldo last weekend, and Jose Aldo won a round and still had 330-27 shouted his way. Dude, so. I think Nazardine could wipe fucking Buckley's nose. His striking can't be that much improved since the Holland fight. It can't be that much improved since the Dichi Carico knockout. He was a short-notice replacement on the Holland fight. talking about the sniper over here. The sniper's going to snipe. Dude. He was a short-notice replacement on the Holland fight. What about the Chicorico head kick? Chicorico head kick, he got caught. Well, I'm just saying. Nazardine Anybody can get caught. You just saw Kamar really Usman. Dude, Nazardine beats both those guys, to be honest with you. Nazardine beats Kevin Holland. Nazardine beats. beats uh, he does not beat Kevin, Kevin Holland. I think he does. I think he fucks Kevin Holland up. How about that? Well, he doesn't because that. Kevin Holland's on 170 year. Kevin's on 170 year. So. Exactly. He had to go running. Yeah, and if you saw the way Gronk put him out on the Gronk stream the other night. Yeah, dude, the Gronk stream. I heard Dana White was saying that Brady almost went to the Raiders, but we don't got time for that because we got. We fight. literally do because, in fact, we are like we have three fights left, and we usually do like a couple and a yeah, half we're hours. Actually, we're actually making great time. For yeah, like like it's it's seven seventeen. I have my whole night ahead. Well, this next one is interesting though. Ricardo Ramos versus Danny Henry, one forty five pound bout, sixteen and four. Ricardo Ramos versus twelve and four. Danny Henry. Um, again, you know, my notes, I just go back to the notes and I have here that Danny Henry is seven years older and hasn't fought in two years. And if you count them up, I mean, you look at, you just take a look, right? Um, you, you just look at, uh, first you got, oh uh, shit. Get you get Hapgrass. a guy training out of Nazareth Hapgrass. Alpha male. All right. Hapgrass. My, my notes are all fucked. I gotta really do okay, so why don't you let me take this away? You know, the only Scott that I really like to take um, is Paul Craig, and it has been to my demise in the past. This guy is two and two in the UFC on a two fight losing streak. Sure, it was to Dan Ige. Sure, it was to Maquan Amir Khani. I think Ricardo Ramos has enough game to get this guy away he's good striking he's good at takedowns ever since he went to alpha male i know you don't really see that with a lot of he, fought a month ago. he fought a month ago and knocked out danny chavez who's a 100 100 like that's what that's yeah. the striking i was alluding to yeah he got knocked out by larone the miracle murphy who showed himself in that fight with leon edwards the miracle was there. Le Lerone Murphy was putting his little paws on the fight, shaking his little crystal ball. Listen, Zubaira Tugulov, not a bad loss. Lerone Murphy, not a bad loss. Sad Nurmagomedov, not a bad loss. And this guy has some great fights in between. Journey Newsom was a bit of a problem when he beat him. Uh, he, he's beaten Bill Algeo, which is our guy. 
Mm-hmm. And as you said, uh, spinning back this is Danny Chavez. So I, I think this is uh, Ricardo Ramos all the way. And if the line is anything other than minus 400, oh, it's minus 450 for Ricardo Ramos, they're crazy because – Danny Henry, he better bring Derrick Henry in his corner because that's the only thing that'll win him this fight. Derrick Henry's an absolute savage. So, yeah, I'm going to go with Ricardo Ramos, too, for all the same reasons, and uh, we can move on. Um, you know, really, it just comes down to seven-year age advantage. His opponent hasn't fought in two years. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, there's great reasons to pick the people we're picking, right? In the Alina Perez fight, you got a girl who's fought a lot more recently against a much older opponent. In the Benoit St. Denis fight, you got a hometown beast of a man against a debutante. In the Ricardo Ramos fight, seven years older, uh, inactive against an inactive fighter. In the uh, Taylor Lopez fight, you got a hometown guy on a win streak, just headlined a fight, fought very recently, facing a guy on a losing streak. The Nazarat fight, much older fighter taking on a guy on a losing streak who's a lot older. Um, so it's like, I personally, at this point, I'm going to say you go Nazarat. You go La Polis, you go Benoit St. Denis, you go Ricardo Ramos, and, you know, that that to me is, is oh, and, and you go with uh, Perez, but we don't really bet on women, so I mean, I wouldn't put her in there. But Luke, yeah. Luke, did you realize that uh, Joaquin Buckley, <laughs> the Jimmy trains out of, is Mercia Lago MMA. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. And it's the shape of an NFL sign <laughs> with the stars. And it says Mercy Lago MMA. I don't see what's so funny about that. It's pretty cool if you ask me. It's like, we love Lamborghinis. We love the NFL. We love fighting. So join our gym. Three cool things. like <laughs> <laughs> They are the coolest things, but it's like, just so weird to see them all integrated. I'll, I'll, I'll leave your invitation to the Lambo football party out of here, then I guess, Alex. Like, no, invite me to the Lambo football mixed martial arts event every single time. If it's just Lambo and football, I don't want to be there. But if it's Lambo, MMA, and football, you can count me in every single time. Well, listen, uh, here's what I'll count on another lightweight matchup. Second fight on the card, Faraz Zayam. Don't be confused. I know, I know. We already went over Zaraf Farayam earlier, but don't be confused. Faraz Zayam, 12-4, and 4, taking on Michael Figlak, 8-0. and 0. Now, to me, this one stood out to me. So I went and I looked at Michael Figlak, uh, his previous fights, because he headlined a couple and he had some good wins. So I went and I checked his fight out. I loved what I saw in his fight against uh, Steve McIntosh. He fought Steve McIntosh. I watched that fight. And uh, I believe that's Steve right. Jobs? No. No, no, no. Okay, okay. Just making sure. Um, I watched that fight. It was a Cage Warriors fight. And um, he beat up a dead man. Cool. No, he, he beat up Steve McIntosh. And it was great because Steve McIntosh was 7 and 1 at the time. Um, and he was taller, kind of like Frazzy Am's going to be. And I love the pressure that I saw from uh, Michael Figlak. He was p- pushing the pace forward. He took them to the ground. He got on top, stayed in guard, controlled them a little bit, ultimately won the decision, and I liked it. So, um, yeah, I like the strength of schedule he has coming out of Cage Wars into the UFC. Yeah, I know he's a debutante, but I'm going with Figlak here because for as I am, I believe he can get taken down and held down here, and I even think that he will get out-pressured and out-volumed um, on the feet. So, smile killer going down. Good decision win against, you know, a couple tough guys, Malarkey, Vendor Amini. Um, but I think that Terrence McKinney showed us how easy it could be to beat to beat Zion. You know, um, I think this guy takes him down. I think he controls him, and I think he wins a decision. Michael Figlag by decision, possibly by submission and ground and pound. Though I mean, like it depends. It depends. You know, it really depends. But he's a mad dog, Mike Figlag, and he's training at a Trojan Free Fighters. And all I know about Trojan. Hey, Free- hey, 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 hey. You show me a mad dog, and you're talking about Trojans. I'm more of a raw dog guy myself. I know, no. the, you miss you stepped all over my punchline because it was Trojan free, and that means no Trojan without Trojan. So that does mean raw dog. That's his gym's name, Trojan Trojan free fighters. Okay, fair enough. So fair enough. Trojan. What's your pick on this one? I'm gonna use bathroom. All right, I don't know if. If I can elaborate on enough to go past Luke's bathroom break, but uh, 
I mean, everything in me is thinking Faris uh, Ziam, but then I look at Michael or Makai's, um no, Michael, Michael, <laughs> Michael the Mad Dog. I look at his former fights, and he's fought Jack Shore. He actually fought Jack Shore in 2015 as an amateur, and I think that's a far better opponent than the smile killer has had, although he did beat – I mean, man, Jamie Malarkey is nothing to – man, this is a very tough fight for me, as the first two fights usually are. Um I told you I watched tape on the guy, dude. Should be hard. I'm going to take three out of five Frenchmen. I'm going to take the smile killer. <laughs> is is this guy really good at wrestling, Michael? He got his opponent down in the cage warriors fight that I saw. But who's Aji Sariadi? I didn't see that one. They didn't have that one available online. Okay, okay. Which one did you see? The one before that. Steve McIntosh, yeah. The mop. Seven and three. Mop. He's from you know who you know who else likes to get taken down from Scotland? Paul Craig. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know who invites somebody to take him down and then lose a decision? Paul Craig. I mean I'm just going to be the antagonist here. I'm going to take the smile killer. He has the UFC experience. Yeah, Cage Warriors isn't all it's cracked up to be. Although he does have the... uh, Ash Williams. Who's Ash Williams again? No, terrible. Two two and four. Never fought again. Dude, yeah. Mm. This feels feels bad for me to take, but I'm going to take the smile killer. I'm going to go three out of five on the Frenchman in France. All right. Well, next we got Dustin Stolfitz taking on Absupian Magomedov. Now, listen, Dustin Stolfitz, we know how he loses, right? Like he gets those little skinny pipe cleaner legs lifted up and put down. And he gets on the ground, dominated, and sometimes choked out even. And he lost his last couple fights by getting choked out. He lost his fight to Gerald Mershark, I believe, right? Um, Yeah, third round submission. Lost his fight against Rafael de Vieira, old man, in the third round submission. This guy, um, Absupian, yeah, he hasn't fought in two years, but he's got a really impressive record 24 and 4 and 1. I mean, this guy's shirt's sure padded all to shit with some guys that have like 25 losses, but he's been active and he's, you know, been there, done that 29 times. It's the 30th time he's done it. I don't really think he's going to get super nervous, right? So not worried about Do you that. recognize a single name on his on his resume? No, I don't really recognize a single name. Except and for like, Lewis put the guns out on Taylor. Lewis put the guns on Taylor, who was like 40. Knocked him out. And knocked <laughs> him out. So that does really the balls. But I don't know. I mean, this one should be easy, right? It should be just like Dustin Solfitz all day. He's got UFC experience. Yeah, he's fought more recently. He fought two weeks ago. That doesn't seem like possible. He fought two weeks ago. That was Dwight Grant. Like how fucking much difference a day makes, right? It's like, holy shit. Like that was, that doesn't feel like that recently, but. Um, I got to pick a dog. The two dogs I had taken a look at, well, besides Vittori, the two dogs I had taken a look at were Buckley and Stolfitz. I didn't side with Buckley here. Check back in with me next Monday to see if either of those switch based on what Dan has to say or some interviews that I see. But I'm going to take Stolfitz as a dog. Yeah, you know, um, the USA has put in their dicks in the crowd's ass numerous times in the history of the world. So I'm going to go with the American here. I'm going to go with Dustin Stolfus. He, he might be a double agent. Who knows? <laughs> but um, I, I think he ruins this guy. I haven't recognized a single name on um, – what's his name? Magomedov's record besides Lewis put the guns on Taylor and Lewis put the guns on Taylor – put him down, put the guns on his head, knocked him out, won a million dollars that year. And then he was like, I'm done fighting. I'm 40 fucking three years old. <laughs> Who the hell cares? So I'm going with Dustin Solfitz. Luke, if you remember, Dustin Solfitz is the guy to slam Joe Pfeiffer and break his shoulder. 
another Joe we'd like to have on the show. Uh, but we'll we'll do what we can out here. Coming soon, coming soon. I got information about that. I'll, I'll I'll touch base with you on that. We're coming soon. We're coming soon. All right. Thank God, Joe Pfeiffer. Love you, dude. Um, Dustin Solfitz all the way. He hearts MMA. I heart MMA. Dustin Solfitz, 14 and 4. Yeah, this guy has 24 and 4 fights, but you got to look at some of these names, dude. You, you can't recognize a single one except for Lewis put the guns on Taylor and Lewis put the guns on his chin and knocked him out. So, wait, was this a short news? No, no. Okay, cool. Yeah. Dustin Solvitz all the way. All right. Well, let us just real quickly um, go over some more housekeeping and take you through our full picks uh, for this card. Let you know what some of the odds are looking like as it stands now. But thank you so much for watching the show. And as we said, patreon.com slash perfect play pursuit. Next Monday, we will be bringing you Dan back to the show with his prelims predictions and his full card predictions. But if you want to get the prelims, you got to go to patreon.com slash perfect play pursuit. We list our bets out in a nice little clean, neat, Google Sheets that you can just click on the sheet, see how we're betting each week. Um, if you want to tail us, it's fine. If you want to fade us, it's fine. If you want to mix and match, take little pieces. That's what I would advise you to go with the ones you agree with. Um, but we have our sheet. And you heard it here first. We get 50 subscribers. Dan and I are going into the all in grappling tournament, wrestling folk style. And you guys deem the winner however you'd like. But just know. That we will be in Joe Selecki's grappling tournament, Dan and I, wrestling folk style, and it will be there for you strictly on the Patreon, not on YouTube. If you exactly. want to have the first look at this grappling match, we might even post it live. Is that possible on Patreon, Luke? Um, we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll see how it works. If at the worst, you get it ten minutes after it happened. So um, well, we're gonna fine. edit it up nice, nice for you guys too. We'll have to do like a pre. Uh, it won't be very long. It'll probably be only like fifty seconds. I'm going to literally ankle pick him, probably half Nelson him right into his back. He's gonna be sitting there like a turtle. He's gonna be like a little fish. Ooh. Yeah. So, Dan, get back from. Spain. I'm gonna make the best so promo video. I'm gonna make Dan into. His, I'm gonna make Dan look like such a heel. I'm gonna cut him saying Joe Lasucky. And I'm gonna, and he's gonna get food when he walks in there. I hope so. I hope so. And I hope he wears like a luchador mask or something too. That'd be pretty, pretty sick. Well, if you're going with me, uh, DraftKings order. This is not the order the bouts are taking place, but here's DraftKings order. Zero gone, minus five forty favorite. Don't like that. We'll be hedging out on Ty. I like Ty. He's a live dog for sure. Marvin Vittori plus one ninety five underdog. My dog of the week. Roman Kapalov plus one hundred five underdog. Get it while it's hot. Nazarod Hopcross minus two hundred five. Amazing value there. That, to me, he's going to win that fight more than Cyril Ghosn wins the fight. So, um, I love those odds. Taylor Lapolis, minus 305. A little bit steep for a debutante, but hey, I'm taking him anyway to get the win. Charles Jordan, minus 140. I love those pick odds, but I wish he was going to draw against Wood. He's always coming in. He's not a debutante. He fought in the UFC before. Okay. Um, Michael Figlak, minus 195. Aline Perez, minus 240. Solfoots, plus 210. BSD, minus 205. Ricardo La Ramos, minus two, uh, 425. And uh, Nazardine Mamov minus two sixty. Ten dollar bet pays four thousand one hundred and four dollars. All right, beautiful. Starting from the top, I've got a lot of dogs on this card. Cyril Gan, Bobby Knuckles. Am I taking? You took Chico. Yeah, Rico. Bobby Knuckles. Bobby Knuckles. Alessio DiGiorgio. Nasser Hapkras. Taylor Lupilis. Nathaniel Wood, uh, Alan Perez, Benoit Saint Denis, Joaquin Buckley, Ricardo Ramos, Faris Ziam, and then Dustin Solfitz. I have more dogs than I would like to admit on this one. I have one dog in Nathaniel Wood, two dogs in Faris Ziam, three dogs in Joaquin Buckley, and Four dogs and Dustin Solfitz floating right around that three to five average that is on each card. Um, so, you know, now that I think about it, I'm not very upset about it, but hopefully some of these fights fall off and make it a little bit easier for us next week. I mean, I don't hope that, but anyway, um, that, you know, it's only 12 fights. We can get through this. 
Dustin Stolpitz is going to be the lone dog, Alex and I agree on. Seven picks in total that me and Alex both agree on. And as you know, if we both agree, that puts it in the 64% win category. So Ricardo Ramos, Benoit St. Denise, Dustin Stolpitz, Elaine Perez, Taylor Lopolis, Nazareth Hopcross, and Cyril Gahn are the ones we have double beat certified. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Patreon.com slash Perfectly Pursuit. We, as always, will uh, be here for you. And, you know, we didn't want to leave you high and dry on the break week. We hope you guys enjoyed the bonus content in this episode. Wanted to make it a super big mega episode. If you want to support the show and help us do things like support Joe's grappling event or donate or, you know, plan trips like the one down North Carolina to watch Alex and Dan fight it out, then. Uh, and that's how you do it. You support the boys. You see how much bigger I am than these fellas, dude. You see it. Dan, Dan is like got fifty pounds on you, bro. He's got fifty pounds on me, but I got fifty pounds of muscle on him. <laughs> well, thank you all for watching. As always, UFC Paris. I can't wait. I do not want this break week, but I had to give you guys the content. Let us know how you feel in the Discord. Keep active and uh, enjoy the fights. As always, man, I'm gonna miss you guys. I hate not doing the show. So this really sucks, but. We got to do what we got to do. We got to take a little break. We got to take a little break. A little break? We're, we're here this week. We're going to be here next week. What are you talking about? We haven't taken I'm any I'm watching break. UFC again. Oh, okay. I was about to say, we're not we're not leaving you guys ever, okay? Until I quit the podcast to find bigger and better things. But besides that. We love you. Rock and roll. Rock and roll.